welcome to our City Council meeting. This meeting is officially called to order. We will start with our chaplain prayer and pledges. So I see uh, people here ready to Gary and Marcella come forward, please. Good morning, Mayor and members of the council. Good morning, everybody. Will you please join with me in prayer? Precious Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we bow before you, the author and finisher of our faith, to say thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, your long suffering and patience. And we thank you for your love and the guidance that you give us. I pray for our city council and our mayor that we will conduct the business of this city in a way that will glorify you and that will be beneficial to all of the citizens of this city. We pray, Father, for wisdom. We pray, God, for guidance. For it is written, the powers that be are ordained of you. So this governmental body here in San Angelo was ordained by you. Now let every member of this body do that which is pleasing in thy sight. We also ask you, Father, even though it's not in San Angelo, but we pray for the people of Ukraine and that war will cease, O oh Father, in Jesus' name, and that the people will be relieved of this great oppression. We pray in the name of Jesus that you help us to be the people of God you would have us to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now for the pledges. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Would Brian Dunn please come forward? And certainly if you have family here, um, also Becky and come forward, please. Okay, <laughs> where they belong. Our Chief Brian Dunn retired from the city of San Angelo February 25th, 2022 with 32 years of service. Brian was promoted to fire chief in January 2001 at the age of 33 and has served in the role for 21 years. Over the years, Brian has played a critical role in two Gulf Coast hurricane evacuations, the FLDS crisis of moving approximately 500 women and children to shelter at the Coliseum and Fort Concho in 2008 and the Wildcat Fire of 2011 that burned approximately 158,000 acres just outside San Angelo city limits. Brian has remained dedicated to the fire department and its mission to provide the community the highest level of life safety and property conservation through training, fire prevention, emergency medical services, fire suppression, and emergency management. His work ethic, enhanced knowledge, and unwavering passion have all furthered the city of San Angelo. Brian's work history includes many accomplishments. A few examples are establishing mutual aid agreements with Goodfellow Air Force Base for firefighting and hazmat, developing a paramedic training program with Howard College, reducing the city's fire rating from class four to class one, resulting and insurance savings for the citizens in excess of $5 million per year, and bringing the Texas State Firefighter Olympics to San Angelo in 2009 and 2017. Brian will be missed by many. We wish to honor him for his service and congratulate him for this well-deserved retirement. We are blessed to have had such a dedicated employee committed to the service of our great city for over three decades. Therefore, I, 
Brenda Gunter, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the City Council, recognize and applaud Brian Dunn for his achievement and positive determination to make a difference in San Angelo. Thank you, Brian. absolute pleasure working with Chief Dunn. Uh, he does epitomize professionalism, integrity, and leadership. Uh, in these past about nine and a half years, we've worked very closely. I feel very blessed to have done so. Um, he will be missed. Uh, he's, the, he's a big part of the city family. And I know <laughs> Brian made a joke about we had a, a ceremony for him on Friday. He said all the people that spoke made him seem like he, he was passing away and leaving us, right? <laughs> But, but that's not the case. We know that he'll be around. I know that uh, at any time that we need to reach out to him for some advice, uh, he'll be there because that's the kind of man he is. Uh, Brian, I wish you the absolute best in your retirement. God bless you. I love you. Thank you. Okay. And Becky's still in his office. It's been my pleasure to serve the citizens of San Angelo and lead the men and women of the San Angelo Fire Department over the past 21 years. Um, I will miss a lot of the people if I don't get to see them. And I'm sure I'll be in and out of council meetings with uh, depending on what's going on around the city. So it's not like I'm disappearing. I'm just uh, taking a rest. So thank you. Yeah. We will now open public comment. Issues or concerns not on the regular agenda may be raised by the public at this time. Citizens should speak from the podium, address all comments to the dais, begin by stating their name and address or single member district number, and limit their remarks to less than three minutes. Do we have individuals who would like to add or come forward and offer public comment today? Seeing none, we will move into our consent agenda. I'm going to start by asking each council member if they have an item that they would like to pull from the consent agenda. I will start with Larry. No, Karen. Lucy. No, ma'am. Harry. No, ma'am. Tom. Nothing to pull. Tommy. No, ma'am. With that, may I have a motion for approval of the consent agenda? So moved. So moved by Harry. A second, please. Second. Larry has seconded that motion. Any public comment concerning the public, I mean, concerning the consent agenda? Seeing none, we will take a vote. All of those in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 With none opposed, this motion, this consent agenda passes 7-0. We will move into the public hearing of an ordinance to outlaw, outlaw abortion, making San Angelo a sanctuary city for the unborn. Pub, a, 6A is a public hearing of an ordinance as presented via petition by the initiating committee to outlaw abortion, making San Angelo a sanctuary city for the unborn, and action by the city council to adopt, reject, or amend the ordinance as presented in the petition. Julia, you're on. 
Yes, ma'am. Um, as outlined in the city charter, um, the initiating committee has followed the certain steps necessary. Um, it is now time for the city council to hear public comment, either for or against the ordinance as presented, and then determine how to move forward. Um, after that, um, depending on what the council decides today, will determine the next steps in the petition process. All right, so do we start with a motion first or public comment first? Um, this is um, a public comment, so um, I would probably just have everybody speak first and then you could make a motion and decide. All right. are, there, are there individuals here today who would like to come forward and speak um, on this um, ordinance to outlaw, outlaw abortion today? If so, please come forward. I remind everyone to please state their name, their SMD uh, area. Good morning. My name is Father Lorenzo Hatch. I'm the rector of the Cathedral of San Angelo, Texas, 20 East Beauregard. I'm not sure what the uh, SMD number is, but I rise today to ask that you please uh, consider this initiative that has been brought to you by many of our citizens. The right to life is guaranteed in our Constitution, and what kind of a society would we be if the most vulnerable aren't protected? You as the elected officials uh, have been given a sacred charge to see for the welfare of all of citizens. And I would say that, uh, that the unborn is the, the most vulnerable citizen of all. And so I encourage you as as men and women who, uh, of integrity, who um, have been given a, a due oath to support the Constitution, that you really consider well um, what we are asking you to do today. Thank you. Yes, Larry. Not the entirety of it, just the summary see any problems with it not in this not in what i read in the summary anyone else like to come forward and offer public comment i'm paul shero i live at 307 north jackson and i preach for the southgate church of christ I'm also on the initiating committee for this uh, uh, ordinance, and I would just like to say we've done everything you've asked us to do, and we need to, we need you to approve this, and let's get on with the rest of our life. Uh, but we're we're going to pursue this as far as it has to go. But this is a right thing. It's a holy thing. It's a good thing, and I think it helps a lot of people. And you can. We ask you humbly and politely, please help us with this. Let's get this settled today. Thank you. Sir, I have a question. Have you read the ordinance in uh, its yes. entirety? Yes. Do you perceive any problems in this? No. It's been tried in other places, and it's uh, a lot of smarter people than me have, have looked at it, studied it, and thought about it, and uh, I see no problem with it. I see a problem with not doing it, but I see a, no problem with it. Any other? Thank you. Further public comment? My name is Stephanie Soha, and I live at 3409 Silver Spur. I'm in um, Larry Miller's. Number six, thank you. Uh, I am from San Angelo, family from San Angelo. I love San Angelo and its people. I'm proud of San Angelo, and I just ask you to please keep us, keep us a good city. We, we love people, we love babies, we have a wonderful pregnancy help center, we have wonderful churches that help and support pregnant girls. We do anything we can for people. We're a very generous people. We're a loving people. We're Christian people. Please vote 
for this ordinance. And yes, I've read it. I have, have no problem. With it? No. Can Thank I ask you. A question: Can a female get an, an abortion in this city today? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I don't know about chemical. I just think that it sends a message that we support life, and we need to stand for life. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jerry Peters. Uh, I am actually from Martin, not here in San Angelo. I'm the pro-life director for the diocese. Uh, one of the human faults is procrastination. Now, take for example, Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor was a lot of people lost because of procrastination. There wasn't, people didn't, didn't look at the problems that were being caused. There was a lot of bureaucracy and everything going on, so lives were lost. 9-11, there was a lot of things going on. People weren't paying attention. FBI and the CIA, they weren't looking, they weren't paying attention. So there was a lot of lives lost. Now today, things are going on. There's a lot of political things going on. Lives can be lost because we're not paying attention. We're saying, oh, well, we can just put this off. Again, procrastination. One life being lost is one too many. Procrastination is not a good thing. Let's, let's get this thing done. And yes, I've read this. Don't see a problem with it. But let's get it passed. One life lost is too many. No, we don't have an abortion here. But that child can go somewhere else. Let's get this law passed so that they can't go anywhere else. They can't get this. We can get some laws passed. Let's get it done. No more procrastination, please. Thank you. My name is Lou McLemore, and I live at 5702 Grape Creek Road. I've been a post-abortion counselor in this city for almost a little bit more than 10 years, and I can tell you firsthand of the devastation and destruction abortion will bring to women and men. Um, we, and you as the city, city council members and mayor, have a moral obligation to protect the defenseless and the innocent. I assume you, rather, you ran for office to make this town a better place, and make this better town for everybody. <clears throat> but bring in, opening the door for Planned Parenthood or any other abortion clinic to come in here is not making San Angelo better. There was no problem voting to make San Angelo a no-kill zone for animals. But why is it so hard to vote for life for little babies, innocent, defenseless? <clears throat> Ronald Reagan said, I've noticed that everyone who is for abortion has already been born. My prayer is for you guys. I pray that God will soften your hearts and you make the right decision. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Mayor, Council. My name is John Barrio. I live at 2323 Wilson Street here in San Angelo. I've been asked by the petitioning committee to read an excerpt from a, a letter from the State Attorney General, Ken Paxton dated May 31st, 2021. This is for the sake not only of the, the whole council, city staff, but also for the public who may not be privy to this letter. It is addressed to the Honorable James Wesley Hendricks, United States District Court for the Northern District of Texas, 
relating to a query he had to the Attorney General. Specifically, it's addressing Lubbock's ordinance, which is the same ordinance with exception of city specificity that we seek to have passed today. Uh, the paragraph is headed, SB 8 clarifies that Lubbock's ordinance is not preempted. Specifically, the quote from the Attorney General, and this is to address, if I will, I'll, I'll take a tangent here. Um, this is to address some concerns that the state law did preempt what the uh, cities were trying to do and vice versa. Specifically, it is stated, a statute may not be construed, let me emphasize, not be construed to restrict a political subdivision from, from regulating or prohibiting abortion in any manner that is at least as stringent as the laws of this state, unless the statute, exp statute explicitly states that political subdivisions are prohibited from regulating or prohibiting abortion in the manner described by the statute. Essentially, the Attorney General was saying, Lubbock did just fine. And they took theirs to the voters to pass, is that correct? That is correct, that is correct. And I was asked to read this on behalf of the petitioning committee, and now I will set it aside and speak as a private citizen, not related to the fact that I do hold a city board position. You know from my previous public comments that I am certainly a pro-life individual. Before you is, uh, let me see, I realize the time is short, but if you will indulge me. Wrap up your sentence, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you have three options. As a matter of public record and transparency, I believe most of us would like to see you first vote on a motion for the adoption of the ordinance. And if it fails, then proceed with your other options. Thank you. Kathy Brown, I reside at 3518 West Beauregard. I just want to thank you all for serving. I know it's not easy uh, in your job, um, but um, as before I've said, uh, in the Word, God tells us that He blesses and He curses, and it has a lot to do with our own actions. And um, if the shedding of innocent blood brings a curse on this land, I live here. <laughs> I don't want a curse on this land. Um, and we also have the option of that is the blessing, and that blessing comes from the protection of the most innocent. And so I just urge you um, to allow God to touch your heart and um, to be a blessing to those who you represent. There are so many Christians. This is a, this is a Christian city, and... Uh, we want y'all to be a blessing to us, and I do speak a blessing over each one of you that God would touch y'all. Thank you for what you do. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> my name is Daniel Martinez. I live in uh, District 3. Um, try to keep this concise, but uh, I just want to speak to three things, y'all. Um, first off this morning is... There was an article about this beforehand that labeled this as a showdown set for Tuesday. Um, this isn't a showdown. This is us starting, wanting to work with y'all. This is us being a city. Um, this is us coming together. I hope that this ordinance is not a, an end goal. I hope that this ordinance is a starting point where we can come together. We can work as a community, as citizens, as officials, and that we can, we can work together on this. We can be a team. Um, Secondly, is that I look at this ordinance as preventative. Um, all of, I'm, I, I work on vehicles, so I'm going to speak from that aspect. All of us here came in a vehicle today. All of us here take those vehicles in for preventative maintenance because we take care of it. We care about it. It's useful to us. How much more important is a life? Us being preventative, we all know the Heartbeat Act 
has already been passed in Texas, and that gives immense coverage. But how much more important is us as a city to be preventative already if something was to happen to that, that our city can stand up and say, listen, we, we are taking a step against this. And the last thing that I really want to speak on is a challenge to you guys and to us. Um, I am on the committee. I am part of this group. I'm also part of the churches here in San Angelo. Hold us accountable. Um, this isn't just that we want this ordinance passed and we want our way. This is a challenge to you guys. If we say that we want this passed and we want this to happen in our city, hold us accountable. Hold us accountable as churches to come beside these women, these families, these babies, to help, to be a source of help. Um, I've seen the comments made, you know, what about the kids that are already here? What about the kids that will be? Me as a father, if I could take them all in and I could provide, I would. And I know countless people in this room that would. And our churches are here for that. Our communities are here for that. So I just ask that y'all consider all of those things when thinking about this ordinance and considering passing it. That this is not, again, an end goal. This is a step for us to work together and to come together and be a city that takes a stand. Thank you. I was doing Scott Ferris, 106 East 42nd Street here in San Angelo. I'm a retired fireman, had the privilege of serving San Angelo for 24 years here, and I enjoyed every minute of it. I still miss you guys, miss your faces. Uh, I just wanted to share a letter that was written from our state uh, senators and representatives supporting uh, this movement. Uh, Charles Perry, Senator Charles Perry, led the way on this letter, and it was given to the city council, and it was addressed to the city mayors, the city council members, and the local officials. How many city, cities and mayors was that sent to? I, I, I cannot answer it. that. I okay, cannot answer that. I'm just saying it. who it's addressed to. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the Sanctuary City for the Unborn Ordinance outlaws abortion within city limits. It declares abortion to be murder and protects municipalities from abortion providers setting up shop within their city's jurisdiction. The ordinance does not defy federal law, but enables cities to take bold action for life while remaining within the existent legal framework of Roe versus Wade. The ordinance does not contradict the United States Constitution, rather the language is intentionally and carefully drafted to protect both tiny Texans from abortion and cities from costly lawsuits. Since there is some immediate enforcement through civil liabilities, the ordinance serves as an important deterrent to the abortion industry from moving into their jurisdictions. Importantly, the ordinance does not penalize women who seek or undergo abortion, but places the penalty on the party who deserves it most, the abortionist and the industry profiting from the unjust procedures. I thank y'all for what you do. You've got a hard job. You've got decisions to make. You know, and that's, that's only in your heart that you can make those decisions. I can't stand here and change your mind, change your heart. All we can do is plant those seeds. And I, I hope and pray for each one of you. Thank you. Greetings. My name is Mark Lee Dixon, director with Right to Life of East Texas, founder of the Sanctuary Cities for the Unborn Initiative. Been involved in all 44 cities in the United States that passed this ordinance, the 40 in Texas, the two in Nebraska, and the two in Ohio. I'm also the only non-government actor that was sued in the lawsuit with the Texas Heartbeat Act that went before the Supreme Court. As you guys uh, know by now that the sanctuary cities for the unborn uh, ordinances paved the way for the Texas Heartbeat Act. We have seen great victories with the Texas Heartbeat Act and the Sanctuary Cities for the Unborn Ordinances. There are currently, there's currently no litigation that's open regarding the Sanctuary Cities for the Unborn Ordinances. Planned Parenthood's lawsuit is over. They withdrew before the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And this ordinance, it has the support. It has the support of representatives and senators across the state of Texas, 
And the city of San Angelo has received that letter. What letter is that? The letter from senators and representatives across the state of Texas in support of these ordinances. And who sent it? I did, and we did do an open records request. We did not get the email that I sent you. And so I decided to bring that email today. It has documented here that I sent you this letter. It says I sent you the letter. It says I sent you the attorney general opinion. And I do hope that you guys have read these letters uh, that have the support of those that have passed the Texas Heartbeat Act. I hope that you guys have read the Texas Heartbeat Act that supports cities passing this, these ordinances. And I will go ahead and hand this over to you guys at this point. There's also a letter here from Jonathan F. Mitchell, who represented me before the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, he is saying that if you'll pass this ordinance that has been given to you guys, he's willing to represent the city of San Angelo at no cost city and taxpayers. This is a matter that, yes ma'am. I know that last year y'all passed, y'all made a decision to pass a resolution in support of the right to life and the Texas Heartbeat Act. But even in that proclamation that was made, there was no reference to the Texas Heartbeat Act. If you really believe the Texas Heartbeat Act, which I do not believe y'all have made a proclamation in support of, then I encourage you, pass this ordinance and not go against the state of Texas, representatives, senators, and the attorney general, and everyone in support of this ordinance. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, just a minute. Larry has a question or a comment. I know you've read this thing, so I won't even ask you that. Do you see any problems with it? Not at all. In fact, this ordinance that y'all have before y'all is virtually identical to several ordinances throughout the state of Texas and the other cities that are doing, uh, that went to initiative process, it's virtually identical to those. Uh, the reason why there's some changes from like the Lubbock ordinance is that the Texas Heartbeat Act has been passed since then. And that's something that really needs to be taken into consideration. I was disappointed that uh, Texas Municipal League pointed to a opinion from Olson and Olson, a law firm with ties to Planned Parenthood that uh, was entertained in Lubbock. But the thing is, uh, the Attorney General letter from Paxton addresses those concerns, and the Texas Heartbeat Act really makes it clear that cities are on good, solid ground for doing this. I have a couple questions yes, that sir. I have problems with on this okay. ordinance. Uh, first of all, it says that the, the mother who, adopt, who aborts the child cannot be held liable in court. I find that just an incredible leap. Well, according to the laws of the state of Texas, and if you have a problem with that part of the ordinance, you'd also have a problem with the Texas Heartbeat Act and the pre-row statutes which criminalize abortion unless the life of the mother's in danger. So the pre-row abortion statutes which have been on the books since before Roe, uh, they never penalized the woman seeking the abortion. So this ordinance and the Texas Heartbeat Act is completely consistent with not penalizing the mother. Uh, that's just the way that our laws are in the state of Texas. Next, uh, there's a, uh, essentially a bounty for people who identify folks as having a criminal abortion of $10,000. I, I personally don't like that. That reminds me of KGB, quite frankly, that uh, you're identifying somebody, and I think this could be problematic in even prosecuting anybody. So I, I don't see any value in that. One of the biggest problems I see with this is that you've outlined certain chemicals that are banned from use because they specifically abort a child. But you allow a morning after pill. I believe that's splitting hairs, quite frankly, because the intent of that, just by the nature of its name, is to deny a, a human life. Well, I'd love to address those concerns. One, the ordinance does not have a, a bounty on the, the mother who has the abortion. She's exempt from, from right. that. Yeah. 
So we're talking about the abortionists and the ones who are aiding and abetting the abortionist. Now, the Texas Heartbeat Act has the exact same provisions as the Sanctuary Cities for the Unborn Ordinances. And so, really, th this issue has already been addressed in the uh, November 1st hearing before the Supreme Court of the United States. And, in fact, many thought that the Supreme Court justices were going to uh, take a stand against the Texas Heartbeat Act because of some of their questioning about the enforcement mechanism. And this is a very enforceable or ordinance. Uh, the ACLU has said that this is enforceable, and they're talking about this enforcement mechanism that we've seen at work here in Texas. The, the way that's laid out, that's how it works here in the state of Texas. So right now, no abortions are taking place on a child with a detectable heartbeat, and it's because there's that private enforcement mechanism. We saw the same thing in Lubbock. In Lubbock, abortions were taking place. And that was in part because the city council, when they first addressed the issue November 17th, they had the, no abortions were taking place in Lubbock. Mm -hmm. And they chose not to pass the ordinance. Abortions started in that time period between when they voted and the election. So April 15th, Planned Parenthood started killing babies in Lubbock. April 19th was early voting. May 1st was the election. June 1st was when the ordinance went into effect. Since June 1st, no abortions have taken place in the city of Lubbock. Is that because the Heartbeat Act was passed the, during that time frame? The Heartbeat Act went into effect September 1st. And so... Uh, what did that do to Planned Parenthood? Well... No Planned Parenthood in the state of Texas can perform abortions on a child with a textable heartbeat. But life begins at conception. And so while the Heartbeat Act has cut down about half of the abortions in Texas, there's only one place that had an abortion facility where no abortions are taking place, and that's Lubbock. That the Lubbock ordinance was successful in shutting down abortion entirely. Now, the question that you had regarding the... Uh, the abortion pill. There's a lot of misunderstandings about the differences between RU486 and the morning after pill emergency contraception, Plan B. Sometimes people lump all those together. Now, Plan B is what you get at Walgreens, Walmart, CVS. The ordinance does not prohibit Plan B, emergency contraception, morning after pill. What it prohibits is RU486, the abortion pill. Now, I do believe that Plan B could cause an abortion, but the way that Plan B is packaged, marketed, uh, it says that it does not harm an existing pregnancy, but on the back of the package it says that it could cause, cause the fertilized egg to fail to implant to the wall, which would be an abortion. Now, Plan B is not addressed by the ordinance. We don't know when it causes an abortion and when it doesn't. That's very different from RU486. So Plan B, could it cause an abortion? Yes, but it's like shooting in a dark alley. We don't know if it took a life or not. With the abortion pill, RU486, we know for sure it causes an abortion. And here in Texas... If you have a problem with that part of the ordinance, then you'd have a problem with the ban on uh, medication abortion uh, by mail that we have. And so this is an issue that uh, the Sanctuary City Ordinance before you, it's in line with the most recently passed laws in the state of Texas. And you guys have passed a resolution saying that y'all support representatives and senators passing pro-life legislation. So this is something that they have done, and how much on board are y'all really with the governor, the attorney general, and the senators and representatives in the state of Texas? I disagree with it, quite frankly. I believe that life begins at that moment of conception whenever that occurs. 
and then any steps you take to possibly abort that is criminal. And I believe most of the people in this room will agree with that too. But what you're suggesting in this ordinance is it's fine and dandy to do that. And I think that is incredibly incorrect, heinous, unethical, immoral. Yeah, we do not support, I personally do not support plan B. I'm just saying we do not know when someone uses plan B, we don't know when a murder has a cause, has, caught, has come effect or not. Just because we don't know when an abortion's caused by plan B and when it's not caused. The abortion pill is a completely different story. The abortion pill is what is uh, given in abortion facilities. It's what's uh, now we're seeing abortion pill by mail all across the United States. And the Biden administration's desire to make abortion access in every zip code, it really does boil down to the deregulation of RU486. And so that's what this ordinance addresses. It addresses abortion pill by mail. It addresses uh, RU486. And the, the possession of that, the distribution of that, completely criminal. Let's stay a little different direction. I notice in here that some therapeutic things could be deemed illegal and immoral. In the case of what's uh, uh, nicknamed the DNC, you don't know if the person is pregnant at that particular moment, but you and this ordinance say that that's specifically illegal. Could you explain that to me, please? Well, a DNC, uh, when that is performed, that is performed knowing that there is a child there. And so that is... Not necessarily so. In the case of a rape, a young lady going into the hospital here, uh, who's go undergone two of the most egregious things that can be done to a human being, the rape and then being pawed over by policemen trying to get evidence. And the third thing is she can't have a DNC, even though there's, there's uh, I mean, it's up in the air. Only God knows whether conception has actually occurred. And yet you're denying that to that victim. This ordinance does not outlaw plan B and plan B is what's in a uh, rape kit. And so we're not addressing, this doesn't address plan B. And so I, I just don't see the relevancy of that, that question. This, when, when someone is raped and there's a rape kit, uh, they go to the hospital, they get a rape kit, that plan B is in there. And so even though I do not support plan B, Plan B is in there, and so that's for those who do support the idea of using Plan B, that's not something that's addressed by this ordinance. So if someone has, um, is pregnant and the baby has no heartbeat, basically dead, this abortion pill is, is a choice given to the mother well, the way that abortion is defined in the uh, ordinance is that it is the intentional killing of an unborn child. If the unborn child is dead, then that doesn't prevent that child being removed, that the, the, the dead child being removed from the body. That's not a crime. That's standard procedure. This is about not killing unborn children made in the image of God. But if the ordinance makes it negative, if you do that, it doesn't make exceptions for that. Yeah, it, Is that correct or not correct? If you'd rephrase that question, just make sure. I... So my, my question is, does the ordinance outlaw, if you will, use of the abortion pill? The abortion pill, when you go to an abortion facility and they give you RU486, it's two drugs. When they give you that, it's because there is a, a, a child there that they're trying to end that child's life and flush that child out. And so 
if that child is already passed, then the way that child's removed, and even though some of that medication may be used for that, that medication's not being used on a child that is alive, that medication's being used on a child which has passed. And that this ordinance is clear that we're not talking about uh, the removal of a child that has passed away. In Does fact, it specify that in terms of use of that pill? Absolutely. The so ordinance is very clear. Even talks about how we're not talking about miscarriages. We're not talking about any of that kind of stuff. And so it is not removing a child that has passed away in the mother's womb. That's not a crime, according to this this ordinance. What the crime is is killing an unborn child made in the image of God. Yes, Tom. So let me ask some questions here. And talk to me about the enforcement. Love to. So, so let me let me just go there. Can this be enforced if Roe and Roe versus Wade is not overturned? Technically, it could. Um, the way that the ordinance is written, it says that this can. There's a public enforcement and there's a private enforcement. The public enforcement is. And that's by the, the city government. The city cannot enforce this unless certain things take place. Now, the overturning of Roe v. Wade is just one of those possibilities. Uh, if a court were to issue a judgment that says that this, the implement, uh, implementing the fines, the penalties of this ordinance would not create an undue burden for the woman seeking the abortion, then we the can't, city... We don't penalize the woman getting an abortion, right? The, the penalty would be for the abortionist and those aiding and abetting the abortionist. But it still goes back to the... Uh, so, pardon interruption. Right. On this ordinance, this takes it down to a 10000 I mean, a $2,000 fine instead of the state-regulated $10,000 fine. Isn't that correct? So, this ordinance is in line with all the laws of the state of Texas. The most that a city government can do for violation of health and safety is $2,000. So that's... But the state fine right now is what? 10000 10000 So there's a big change or a discount going from the existing law to this ordinance, correct? Well, the way this is written, this is written for, for city, according to city law. Now, so the penalties of the city is what we're talking about there. Now, as far as the enforcement goes, the private enforcement is immediate, and the ACLU has admitted to this. In uh, Lilith Fund versus the city of Wascombe, uh, they said that this, uh, this ordinance, the Wascombe ordinance, is immediately enforceable. And so if the ACLU is saying that this ordinance is immediately enforceable, specifically seeking, speaking of the private enforcement mechanism, then you can you know, bet that it's immediately enforceable. And so the way so this... So what's the private... I mean, I'm getting lost. So what's right. the private enforcement mechanism? And Teresa, I'm going to need your help here. So the private enforcement mechanism is the city is creating a private cause of action, which allows the citizens to... If an abortion is performed in the city of San Angelo, then uh, the citizens can file a lawsuit on the abortionist and anyone who aids and abets the abortionist for the death of the unborn child. That citizen would have to have proof of the abortion through either hearsay. I mean, so here, here, I mean, is this thing not 20 years retroactive versus Roe versus Wade? I mean, from the overturn, does it not go back and say for a period of up to 20 years? So this ordinance, the way it's written is there's no statute of limitations. So okay. if this ordinance were to be passed today, an abortion was performed tomorrow, even so the citizens could file a lawsuit against the abortionist, but the city later on, if Roe v. Wade's overturned, could file a lawsuit as well because the law would be broken during a time in which the ordinance was enacted. So if a woman left this city 
in the state of Texas to have an abortion, then what? Well, it would be against the law for an abortion to be performed on a San Angelo resident. So if that citizen goes to New Mexico and has an abortion, then this ordinance would penalize her, or if someone claimed wouldn't I mean, penalize her, it would penalize the one who killed her innocent child. But if that doctor is in New Mexico where abortion is legal, how do you do that? Well, abortion here, you know, we have laws all across our state. Um, Councilman, uh, if you were to order uh, ammo and you were in New Orleans, Louisiana, and you were trying to get ammo shipped to you, couldn't happen because it's against the law to ship ammo into New Orleans, Louisiana. Same thing applies with the abortion pill. If this ordinance passes, it's against the law for the abortion pill to be shipped here. And likewise, it would be against the law for an abortion to be performed on a San Angelo resident wherever they are, whether that be San Angelo, Texas, or Dallas, Texas, or Washington, D.C., or New York, New York that the killing of an innocent child made in the image of God is not something that should be allowed on any San Angelo resident. That's what this ordinance says. So isn't that already in effect right now with the heartbeat law? Not at all. Explain that to me, that this is better than the existing law. So the Texas Heartbeat Act, and I'm fond of both. I'm very fond of both. Right. Um, have a relationship with both of them. So right now, what's happened Abortion rates have dropped dramatically in Texas, but people are going outside the state of Texas to get an abortion. The abortion facility in Shreveport, Louisiana. That. So how many lawsuits have been filed based off of that? Based on? If, 60 if abortions have dropped in Texas by 60%, but in Oklahoma they've picked up by 70%, has there been any lawsuits filed on any individual based off of that information. So the Texas Heartbeat Act does not penalize those who are leaving the state of Texas for an abortion. And so those who are going to Louisiana right now, the Texas Heartbeat Act does not address that issue. It only addresses within the, the boundaries of Texas. So in essence, this ordinance would be an ordinance that you as a citizen, if you left the state of Texas, it still follows you wherever you go? It's about San Angelo residents. So no San Angelo resident uh, could have, an, an abortion cannot be performed on a San Angelo resident. And it's really specific to, those are unborn children made in the image of God. And we've got to protect those lives. So if you live in Mertzen or Cristobal or Grape Creek or Eden, it doesn't apply. It's bound by the city limits, correct? It's a city well, ordinance. It's a city ordinance. However, the private enforcement mechanism, so if an abortion was performed on a San Angelo resident in Eden, then... I'm asking about an Eden resident. Oh, so yeah, it, an Eden resident. Is, this is very specific, as Tom said, to our yeah. city limits. Yeah, so, so Eden residents are not bound by this ordinance. Y'all only have the ability to pass laws for uh, y'all city and those who live within y'all city limits. Ma'am, I have Larry, a question please. that goes back to jurisdiction. Now, if, if uh, I went to Arizona and I killed a person who was from Texas, the jurisdiction would be the folks in Arizona would prosecute me. I don't see how, how this fits in with a logical sense of uh, judi judiciary power to prosecute somebody for an act that happened in another, uh, another area. I, I just don't get that. So if we have an American citizen killed by a terrorist overseas, we have the jurisdiction to go over there and take care of that situation. And so the similar rule would apply here. Would like the city attorney Sorry, would you like this. to talk? Yes. Teresa, would you like to add comment? Yeah, I mean, I want to point to um, 
Well, there's a couple of sections actually that are kind of relevant. The first section under the abortion prohibited does say the section does not prohibit referring a patient to have an abortion which takes place outside the city limits. So you can still refer someone to have an abortion outside the city limits. There's also a provision that says neither the city of San Angelo nor any officers or employees nor any district or county attorney or any executive or administrative officer or employee of any state or local government entity may impose or threaten to impose a penalty unless Roe v. Wade or those other things we talked about happen. So as of today, those things haven't happened. So there's nobody, including the district attorney, who could prosecute this. Um, this is a significantly different ordinance from what was passed in Lubbock, and I do believe it's in response to the Heartbeat Act. But I think there's also been changes from what was proposed to us in the fall that you guys decided not to pass. <clears throat> One of those things is the original ordinance allowed us to have some ability to enforce this. This particular version of the ordinance takes all ability of city officials to enforce this ordinance away. Our only recourse is to refer it to the district attorney to enforce. And again, that provision says she doesn't have the authority to enforce it either unless those things happen. And then as far as jurisdiction, I mean, I understand the federal government has long arms of jurisdiction, but city's arms really reach only to the ends of our city limits. Um, so I know of absolutely no authority that would allow us to prosecute somebody for happening in New Mexico. And there's a provision in the ordinance that does say the section may not be construed to prohibit conduct that the city of San Angelo is forbidden to prohibit or regulate under state or federal law. So I think under both and state and federal law, we are prohibited from regulating activity that takes place in another city, outside our city limits, or in another state. So I think on its face, the ordinance contradicts what was said regarding our ability to prosecute somebody for something that doesn't happen here. I have Thank a you. question. Yes, Karen. And, and it's an easy one after all of the legal debate. I'm curious, you, you said this uh, has passed in 44 cities, is that correct? So Across. the Sanctuary City for the Unboard Ordinance has passed in 44 cities. I would and like to know how many of those were passed by proclamation from a city council and how many went to a public vote. I would love to let you know that information. So all the cities except for Lubbock passed by their mayor and city council. And you said proclamation, not ordinance. Oh, are you talking about an ordinance or like an ordinance outlawing abortion, are you talking about a... Yes, our, our statutes by ordinance in most cities do as well. Okay. My, my mistake. Language. Okay. Uh, so uh, 43 cities have passed through their mayor and city council, and only one, Lubbock, has passed through a vote of the people. And the reason that they were passed through mayor and council, uh, the majority that we have heard as far as the reason, reasoning is that they were elected to represent the people and that they wanted to, they saw this as a no-brainer uh, issue just like any other issue that they were addressing. How many of these cities um, passed a sanctuary city thing before the Heartbeat Act was passed? Actually, the, uh, quite a bit, uh, we had um, over half, so, so Lubbock was number 26, and the, the Heartbeat Act had not, uh, had not been enacted at that point. And so uh, it, was, it, was, it went into effect, I believe, that month, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, it, it, went in, it was passed that month, I believe, but it didn't go into effect till September 1. So, so most of these cities passed a sanctuary law before the Heartbeat Act was passed. Absolutely. In fact, as I said earlier, that the sanctuary city ordinances paved the way for the Texas Heartbeat Act. Other questions from council for Mark? Another thing too on something that she had mentioned, the severability clauses, it, they're, they're in there for a reason and if there is one part of this that the court disagreed with, it wouldn't um, annihilate the rest of the the ordinance it would just annihilate that one one part and so uh, that that gives a lot of, of cover for the ordinance as well further public comment if so please come forward thank you 
everybody but uh, uh, Mrs. Smith. No Name, survival. please. I'm and Ryan Buck. I live at 10042 uh, Floyd Lane in San Angelo, Texas. I'm very grateful all the council members are here today. Um, I am uh, also grateful for uh, your inquiries and questions today. Um, I, um, I, I wish we would have had those inquiries and questions months ago when we began to come. I also hope you've all read the ordinance. I've read it on more than one occasion, and I do not have any problems with it personally, but I, I just have a couple quick things to say. Um, we came to you with thousands of individuals from across the county, not just the city, who were wanting this ordinance. We came to you and asked for you to pass it. It was sent to you back in the summer. Um, I did file the open records request, and there was a lot of information that we didn't receive from that. Um, I think there were probably less than two or 300 documents. We did the same thing in Abilene. I didn't. They did, and they got over 4,000 documents. I'm curious why that was the case. But we came to you and asked you to pass it, but you said no. You said you weren't going to do it. You had the, the opportunity to put it on the ballot, but you said you weren't going to do that. Our mayor said more than once, we're going to do it the way of Lubbock. And said, we said, okay, we'll go the way of Lubbock. We did the referendum, uh, and we got the signatures. Uh, whenever Lubbock got their signatures certified, the city council had a, a public hearing scheduled within 14 days. The city of San Angelo City Council and the mayor have drugged their feet over a month. Um, I don't understand why. I saw a memo in that open records request saying there'd be more voters in November, and I think there probably will be. Uh, we just ask, uh, on behalf of the thousands of citizens of, this, of San Angelo, Texas, uh, that know about the ordinance, have read the summaries, many have read the actual ordinance, we ask that you vote on this ordinance today. Vote for what you think is best for San Angelo. If you've got problems with it, don't vote for it. But don't think the vote is just to send it to the ballot. You're making a statement yourselves, our representatives of San Angelo, on where you stand on this issue of life. And I know that might feel uncomfortable for me to say, or for you to hear from me to say, but that's just where we are. Uh, the citizens that have been working this process feel like there's been pushback. That's why we haven't got questions, um, you know, months ago when we were coming. Inquiries. Ask those inquiries. No, no, and I've never had any inquiry of me. I've never had anyone reach out to the initiating committee with these questions or even at, at, at the public council meetings. So we just ask that you please take this voted up and down. Thank you very much. My name is Denise Barber and I live in single member district five. I believe we have an obligation to examine all aspects of the ordinance. The Sanctuary City for the Unborn Initiative, or sometimes called movement, um, is the reason for this ordinance. I believe that there are citizens that support life, but at the same time they have concerns with the development of the ordinance. The concerns that I have about the ordinance development is that past public statements that do not reflect our city, our diverse population, and our diverse religious churches. And I've had um, time that I've discussed this with my own bishop. Most notably, um, is the referencing of abortion to the Holocaust. And I have the article is Sanctuary City for the Unborn Movement Spreads to West Texas. In it, it is stated, abortion is comparable to the Holocaust. It is the civil rights of our day. I am so thankful for the chaplain that prayed for Ukraine. And I hope that we never use Ukraine as, a, as an example with abortion. They are two separate things. We are asked to honor the atrocities of the past. And I think you minimize when you use your own language. Um, 
another example that references abortion to the Holocaust in the Dallas Observer newspaper, um, fed up with legislative moderation. We shouldn't be frivolous about the throwing away of, of human life, offering a Nazi analogy. We have seen cultures, like in World War II, the Nazis. Again, this is offensive and it's insensitive to the population of our community. Furthermore, there's another reference about comparing abortion with slavery. There's no right to abortion in the Constitution, so it's just like the issue of slavery. The federal court was wrong on that, and the Supreme Court is wrong on abortion. Um, I have a problem with this because, again, you're, you're minimizing what happened in our country. You could wrap it up with your last sentence, please. I just would like to close saying that if we know what's been said and we do nothing, then what does that say about us? Are we not held accountable to the language that we use? That's my concern. Thank you very much. May I leave this? or? Well, good morning, and uh, we appreciate you being here with us today. I'm Bobby Roger. I'm in uh, Councilwoman Lucy's district, and appreciate all what y'all do. Uh, I've been asked to give these to you. Uh, I didn't do these, but uh, I think Mark gave me to put a gift to you about the cities who have passed this, this uh, ordinance. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the, our, our big room across here to the right was filled with hundreds of San Angelo citizens for the, the prayer breakfast, and it was wonderful. And uh, some of you may have been there. Uh, uh, Dr. Tony Evans spoke, and he, he mentioned some things about what do we use as a basis for our decisions. And he talked about in a church we use the Bible. In families, you know, well, he said I would use the Bible to counsel a family. In individuals, I would use the Bible to, to counsel an individual and things like that. But he said uh, it's an amazing thing when it comes to government, we throw out uh, often the Bible and use another playbook. And, uh, you know, if, if we really are a Christian city and a Christian nation, uh, I hold dear to the Word of God as the, our playbook. And yeah, I think it's pretty simple. Uh, what it says about this, and I know there's, we're going to debate the language for a long, long time to come. But before the Lord, I, I think if we if we claim to be Christians, and you claim to be Christians and Bible believers, and uh, you know it's, it's pretty plain in the Ten Commandments: Thou shalt not kill. Uh, however, you want to water that down or, or word it, it's, it's okay, I guess. But uh, God didn't didn't He meant what He said. So I would encourage you that, you know, let's, let's make this decision based on, on the Bible if we claim to believe the Bible, you know. Uh, but I appreciate what you do. We pray for you. I know it's a tough decision, and you need wisdom. And appreciate our new councilwoman here with us. It's your first time, so this is probably a real fun time for you. But anyway, uh, uh, we appreciate what you're doing, but we ask you to consider, uh, let's not go to November. We don't have to be like Lubbock, you know. Well, let's, we can be like the other ones and do it that way. But God bless you. Thank you for hearing me out. Good morning, my name is Greg Breedlove. I live at 614 Avondale. I'm sure one of you fine citizens is uh, my representative. I look forward to getting to meet you. I'm the preacher at First Baptist Church, but today I stand before you just as a citizen. I'd like to speak as a father. I have four children that we adopted out of the foster system when we used to live in California, and I'd like to just speak to that very briefly. All four of them have very interesting backstories. All four of them had all sorts of uh, what we might call challenges uh, when they were brought into this world. But I'd like to talk about my daughter, Katie. She's a third grader at Cornerstone. She's a superb student. She's an AB student. When I drove her to school earlier today, she said, I'm so excited to go to school today. And I was so excited to drop her off. And I didn't really come here intending to talk about her, but I'd like to talk about her for just a minute. 
When we were going through the process of fostering her in California out of Sonoma County, just north of San Francisco, we would have to take her every couple of weeks for a visitation with her birth mother. And through that process, we got to know the birth mother a little bit, and I noticed that she was a little bit older, and I thought, well, I wonder how many other uh, birth siblings Katie might have. And so I asked the social worker one day, does Katie have any other brothers and sisters that may have been adopted out? And she says, no, you want to know what the mom told us? I said, yeah, I'd be very interested to know that. Katie was actually her first child to actually be born. Up until that point, every other time she had become pregnant, as soon as she found out that it was a boy, she would have an abortion. And so the only reason that Katie is alive today is simply because she's a girl. I think that that's unfortunate. I know that we talk about all of these... Um, we talk about all of these times when people have abortion and all these really challenging circumstances, but there's a whole lot of frivolous abortion that goes on as well. And so I think anything that a city or municipality can do to stand up for the right of life is a good thing to do. So I've read this. I agree with it. I hope that you guys will take some action on it. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, Mayor, uh, uh, Council. Uh, my name is Lacan Mariano. I, I actually live on Edinburgh in, in, in the, uh, at Highland Range. I used, I'm pastor at College Hills Baptist Church. And um, I just want to say, I know we've, you've heard a lot of things today. Uh, like Greg, I want to say something about my family. We, we have two children. We had, we had two children when we came here, two boys. And we wanted to have more than that. In fact, I used to tell my wife that my goal in life was, to, uh, was, was uh, uh, five by 35. And, uh, <laughs> but for after our second child, Josh, our second son, we had Mike and then Josh. And they were six and four when we moved to San Angelo. And uh, uh, we couldn't get pregnant, or she couldn't get pregnant. And uh, we, we prayed and we prayed, and she, my wife would cry. And there were many times we'd n we knelt uh, by our bedside asking God uh, to, to give us another child. And in fact, I remember praying one, one night, is it, is, is it, if this child is not going to receive Christ as, her sa as his or her Savior, is that the reason then we're okay? But we are asking you, Lord, to give us a child. Well, seven years later, we had Rachel. And fast forward to when she was in college in New Mexico. And uh, she, had, she was having female problems, and the doctor told her that chances are you'll never have any children. And so she cried, and we cried with her, because I know what she's seen in our family. She got married after college. They serve as missionaries in, in uh, Belize. Uh, while they, in Belize, guess what? She got pregnant. And I still remember when Nehemiah was born, she painted a uh, on, on a frame, on a, on a, she was, she's a painter, and she said the, the, the prayer from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, and it says, I prayed for this child, and the Lord answered my prayer. She just had another baby last July, and it's their fourth child. And it's so exciting. I have right now 10 grandchildren, and we have one that's coming uh, next month. No, in two months. And, and I want to say this, that it, life is so precious. Life is so precious. Uh, David, in Psalm 139, he said, You search me and you know me, O Lord. Before a word is on my lips, you already know him, O Lord. Where can I go when your spirit is not there? If I go into the far, into the, into the far side of the sea, your spirit is waiting there for me. If I go to the heights or to the depths, uh, there's nowhere that I can go where your spirit is not there. And then in verse 14, he says, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And it was, the, it was God who created this baby. Jeremiah chapter 1, it says, Before I created you in your mother's womb, I already knew you and I have appointed you to be a prophet to the nations, not, not only to, to, to Israel, but to, to the nations. And so I just, up, yes, ma'am. Uh, and let me just say this. If I understand all the, the legal jurisdiction that you all were talking about, and I agree with you, yes, it's at conception, and I understand that. But we cannot worry about what is not going to happen, what we have no jurisdiction over. Here in San Angelo, let's make a decision. I want to encourage you all. Let's make a decision to say life is precious, and let's stand on that. We are praying for you all. Thank, Thank you. you very much.
further public comment? My name is Susie Smith, and um, I'm in District 6. Larry is my um, councilman. And um, as, as all this has been going on, things have been going through my mind. And I remember uh, back in the 70s when we were sold that abortion was a solution. And I remember the words, no child, an unwanted child. And what has it wrought? Today, there have been four ordinances on the front page, four ordinances that were passed, 7-0. We didn't vote on those. We didn't read anything. No, I haven't read it. But I trust the people who wrote it. Just like we have to trust you as a city council. I was just my stomach when I think about how this has been addressed and yet the pride that this city had, the city council expressed that we don't kill trees here in San Angelo. Oh, we just don't want to kill trees. We're going to take a stand on not killing trees. And the pride that we don't kill dogs. We're a no-kill dog. I was sick to my stomach. And yet, all of this, because we want to save the life of children in the womb? Abortion is the killing of a child in the womb. Are you against the killing of a child in the womb? Or are you for the killing of a child in the womb? It's that simple. <clears throat> Roe v. Wade was passed saying, we don't know when life begins. Y'all remember that? We don't know when life begins. But if we find out when life begins, of course, doctors knew. But if we find out, we'll have to revisit Roe. Please, please, let's value the life of babies in the womb at least as much as trees and dogs. Thank you. Marcy Capacer, 11650, Lime Room. Um, <clears throat> there's an article or an essay here, um, Why uh, Freedom Lovers Should Be Pro-Life. Uh, and I believe a lot of what is said, and I'll quote some of it. There are two and only two possible sources of our freedoms. Either they come from the state's generosity, in which case the state can rightfully confiscate them, or they can, are naturally assigned to each of us through being human, in which case they are inalienable and cannot rightfully be confiscated by the state. It not only means that government cannot rightfully deprive us of certain liberties, but also that it cannot treat individuals differently. The government does not have the authority to give these rights to someone while withholding them from others. Abortion supporters uphold a different foundation for the endowment of rights. To them, the rights of life and liberty aren't inalienable. These rights are assigned to each of us by our mother, father, grandparents, abortionists, or anyone else who has influence in the decision to abort or not abort us. Because those people assign those rights to us, they can rightly deprive the right, us of the right to life and liberty. This fundamental difference is a direct threat to liberty because it is attempting to shift the foundation of where our rights come from. Abortion undermines the very principle of inalienable rights, which should scare all lovers of liberty, along with anyone who claims to be an advocate of human rights. Declaring San Angelo a sanctuary city for the unborn is a much needed move towards reclaiming our natural individual rights. It will give the citizens of this city the moral authority upon which to make future decisions based on the common good. 
the common good is something that, is e that each individual shares a benefit in. It is defined as always being oriented towards the progress of each individual. Texas passed the Heartbeat Act, and the council has stated that it's good enough for San Angelo. In my opinion, the Heartbeat Act is yet another attempt at government to claim the authority at which stage of life we can claim our natural rights. If we as a city can boldly claim that the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is granted to all humans, born and unborn, then we can truly start to live free with love and respect for ourselves and each other. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Trevor Hansen with uh, District 4, Ms. Gonzalez. I uh, just come, come to you uh, this morning as a father. Uh, we're going to have our fourth child in May, a baby girl after three boys. Um, and I uh, just want to encourage you. I know we've talked about the legality of, of some of this and what it does and does not address. And, and I understand that those are important things and we shouldn't just breeze by them, but I just want to encourage you um, that uh, when we all stand before God one day, uh, we are not going to be held to the standard of what our culture said was right. We're not going to be held to the standard of what was popular at the time that we lived. Uh, we're going to be held to the standard of God's perfect character. And we know that he values life. He is the arbiter of life and death. We are not. When we allow abortion, when we take part of that in that, and when we are um, associated with that, uh, we are taking part in an activity that God despises. Only he is sovereign and only he is the arbiter of life and death. He, he gives it and he takes it. We need, to, we need to leave that in his hands. And so I encourage you to, to support this and uh, take a stand for what is true and what is right and what is according to God's character and just knowing that we will all stand before God one day and give an account for the life that we've lived. And I, ho I hope most of all that you stand before God in Christ. Thank you. morning. My name is Sharla Inostrosa, and I live at 113 Las Lomas Drive. I'm here today to say that I pray that you will pass this. Um, I was blessed to have been adopted in 1963 before Roe v. Wade. Not only was I adopted, but in my family, my cousin was adopted, my aunt was adopted, and I have a sister-in-law who was adopted. And I think what it comes down to is you have to ask yourself this, or you have to say this, planned or unplanned, a crisis pregnancy or a much, preg or a much prayed for pregnancy. A baby is a baby, and we have to value their life. And I think back, I don't know the circumstances for my adoption, but Psalm 22:11. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. And I am so thankful. I am so thankful for my life and the lives of my children and my grandchildren. Because adoption gives generations, whereas abortion ends generations. So please... Please think about this. As she said, are we, why are we so concerned about trees and, and animals? I mean, yes, th those are important, but my goodness, is it really that hard to say that an unborn baby's life matters? Please pass this ordinance. Thank you. Brian Angle, single member District 5. I know you guys are going to have a very tough vote here in just a little bit, and there may be some divisions between you all and the board and all of that, and I wish to offer a compromise. 
because we've got this this thing that must that's very weighty for us to decide. Clearly, um, if there's people who would vote against that or want to push it onto the ballot in November, um, that gives a voice to the people and that allows them to say whether they want it or not. Some would call that procrastination. Some would call that due diligence. Um, if that's the message that you want to portray, then there ought to be a compromise to help people who are concerned about what happened in Lubbock that as soon as that ordinance was passed that they had an abortion clinic that set up. And the city council can act to deny permits and zoning in such a way that no new ones can be set up and could deny any uh, to action on any, uh, bu any property that's previously zoned for that use until after this election is done. And that gives everybody a chance to do the due diligence and it kind of takes the risk that Lubbock brought to us. Been a lot of misinformation from people who are presenting different sides of this, questions from people who maybe were not as informed about medical procedures or the legal portion of the of jurisdiction extending beyond the city limits and into the state of New Mexico. But that's really not the that's really not the issue at hand. The issue at hand is are we going to allow abortion in San Angelo or not? And that's something that I would I would advocate that we not do but I think that there's a way that we can let the people have their own voice, not just the people in the audience here, but the people at, at the ballot, because that's how, we, how you all got elected, is by the people at the ballot. And so I, you know, and if the delay costs money to a, a certain portion of the population who advocate for this, I would say their God owns a cattle on a thousand hills, so money is, should not be an issue. I think that the council needs to use Use to, needs to use wisdom, but also listen to the voices of the people who elected you. Further public comment? If you've spoken once already, um, it, you can't come before us again. Good morning, Madam Mayor and the esteemed members of the City Council. My name is Amanda Mason. I live in City Council District 4. Um, I am a, I consider myself a native San Angeloan. I grew up here. I graduated from Lakeview High School. Um, I went off to Texas Tech. I'm currently going through a career change. Uh, I attend nursing school at Howard, which is why I'm dressed like this today. I had a test this morning over the endocrine system and the urinary. It? I did, I got a 90, so. Congratulations. <laughs> I am here this morning um, to be kind of unpopular, but I'm here to speak out against this. I, uh, while I personally would never have an abortion, what I have heard this morning sounds a lot like vigilante justice. And we talk about, if we're following somebody to New Mexico and saying they can't do something else in New Mexico, that's not right. I'm sorry. Like, I, one of the things that I have learned working in healthcare, I actually used to work at the Rape Crisis Center here. I've been with women in their worst moments. The absolute shame of having to have people take pictures of you and take swabs. It's, it, it's very invasive. And one of the things that we talk about in school is we always go for the least invasive treatment. I believe San Angelo does a wonderful job of discouraging abortion as it is. We've got pregnancy crisis centers. We've got wonderful churches here that step up and help people make that decision for themselves. I don't, I believe this, making it, telling people what they can and cannot do in the city of San Angelo, they can't do with their bodies, is just, it, it's very invasive. It's the most invasive. So the least invasive would be to do things like encourage, um, you know, provide supplies, like my stepmother does. She works in Redosa, and they provide supplies to crisis pregnancies. But unfortunately, like I said, this is, um, we talk about how we want to let the free market decide things and things like that. You know what? Let's let a person make that decision between her and God. And, you know, I would like to give one example is, we have patients, I mean, not, I haven't had a patient personally, but there are patients out there who have decorated their nurseries. They're ready for their baby, but they found out that their baby is going to suffer when it's born. So are we going to force this woman 
to carry that baby and deal with that until she has it? Like, are we saying we, she cannot have that baby taken out of her womb? We're no way to terminate that pregnancy before the baby's born to where it's not gonna suffer? That's not our decision to make. Thank you. Seeing no one else come forward, and if there is someone else who wants to come forward right now, please do so, else we will move into. Stop. <laughs> Uh, I'm actually really impressed. It's amazing that so many conservative voices. Your name and your oh, district, sorry. please. Spencer Matthews, SMD5. Uh, thank you all for doing this. And I'm amazed at all the conservative voices. And, and I'm, I'm actually, I moved back to San Angelo to be around conservatives. So it's really nice to see everybody show up. Uh, I would further kind of stress and maybe challenge everybody to, to step back and think about, uh, we, we live in a republic and people, have elected people to represent certain parts of their life. And, and I was in part of the SMD5 race, and I never heard this came up. come up. Nobody ran on the right to life or abortion or anything like that. And I kind of find the process a little bit backwards, I think. Uh, in, we have a, a Congress, and we have a veto power of a president. We don't see that in this situation. And so I, I challenge the process that the people need that aren't aware of this need to be able to take this to a ballot and hear that. Um, I don't want to delay the process. I think the heartbeat bill is a great thing. I'm pro-life. But at the same time, there's a process. And I think this is kind of circumnavigating that on some member districts that didn't, you didn't campaign on this. You ran, ran on sidewalks and infrastructure. And I think this kind of goes beyond that. And I think it I think it puts too much pressure on a city council. I think it needs to go to a ballot and do something a little bit different. That would be my personal opinion. Thanks. Any further public comment? With none, then we will, um, I guess, ask for a motion. Is that what we do? So, um, what we also need to make clear is that I believe, well, I'm going to ask for a motion um, to accept this as an ordinance to be voted on by the city council. Is that the correct language? If you want to do that, it would just be a motion to approve the ordinance as presented. That would be what I just said. <laughs> All right, I'll start with um, Tommy Hebert. So what are we voting on? My, nobody made, motion nobody made a motion. Nobody made a motion. Okay, so is there a motion? Hearing no motion. Now what do I do? You, you need a motion either to um, approve the ordinance with some amendments or a motion to deny the ordinance. Actually, let me correct that. It's either adopted the way it is at this point, adopted with some amendments, or rejected. Okay. Do I have anything from council? Tommy? Mayor, I have long since this issue started, I have long said that this is an issue that needs to go to the voters. Um, th this, 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 this to me is, uh, we can see from the, the conversation this morning that it's, it's complex, um, it's got many layers to it. Um, uh, the, I have had um, uh, as many people say to me, I want to vote on this, as have not said that to me. So I would make a motion um, to deny the ordinance and send it to the ballot. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Lucy. We will ask for further public comment. Yes, sir. Does this motion allow any amendments to the uh, current ordinance? We would vote on this as it is, and if it is passed or rejected, then we'd take up something else. Just but one, this is 
sorry. <laughs> uh, just one point of clarification. With the motion on the table to um, reject the ordinance, that does not automatically send this to the voters. The initiating committee then has to send a letter, a statement saying that they want it to go to the voters and in what format. So this does not automatically send it to the voters. It's, you're just taking action on the ordinance, not on the next steps. Okay. So there's a motion, there is a second. We will take a vote. I'll start with Tommy. Aye. Tom. Aye. Harry. I wanna make a statement first and then I'll. First of all, and I've said this since the beginning, I'm pro-life, always have been, always will be. Of course at 76, how long that'll be, I don't know, the good Lord will have to let me know. But the bottom line is, is that we've got 50 people in the room today give or take a few. 50 people should not make the decision of 100,000 people in San Angelo. So, aye. Larry. Yes, please. Uh, I think we've discovered in this process that there are significant flaws in this proposed ordinance that uh, I, I cannot accept as it is. Do I believe there is a reason for this ordinance? Yes. And in an amended form, I can agree with it. But with some of the portions of this that uh, just uh, make no sense to me and are probably extra legal in some respects, uh, I would choose to uh, reject but allow for amendments to it and for it to move on. Karen? I have a comment as well, and it's very personal, so bear with me. Um, I'm a survivor of a violent sexual assault, and I'm also the parent of an adopted child. I'm also pro-life, but I'm going to vote in accordance with the other council members. I want it to go to the public, and I think there are good reasons for that, and I think there needs to be some careful amendments considered before we go there. Lucy? I'd like to make a statement please. Also. Um, I just want to say thank you to the committee that went and did all their hard work, their research, brought it back to us and everything. Thank you very much. Um, at the same time, like that's been said, we do have a room full of people, but there's a lot of people out there that should have the chance to express their vote and the way that they can do that is by going and voting either way, but ha let their voice be heard also. I too am pro-life and I strongly believe that abortion is something that um, should not be allowed. But I'm also a big proponent of allowing the public to choose and to vote. I strongly support taking this to the voters for their opinion on it. We are a very conservative city and um, I believe the citizens will do the right thing, but I do believe it needs to go to the citizens, so I say aye. With that, Harry's, uh, I mean, Tommy's motion is passed 7-0. No. I believe I, I suggested that I would vote for it if it was amended, so I believe I'm so, amending. Okay, so thank you for that clarification. So it is a six to one vote. I say aye, or did I just finish my statement and well, I didn't I think vote? You said I said you support. aye. Yes, yes. ma'am. All right. With that, what's the next step? Uh, the next step would be for a um, letter to come from the initiating committee stating how they want to move it forward. I believe we may have that here. <laughs> Would you like me to read it into the record? Yes, but let me ask another question. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh. Okay, it just says, um, in light of the San Angelo City Council's decision to not adopt the ordinance for the sanctuary city for the unborn, we, the undersigned committee, do hereby demand that the ordinance be placed on the November ballot of 2022. Please allow this letter to serve as such notice from the initiating committee. All right, with that, let me ask the question. So with Larry's comment is do we first of all consider 
changing some of the language before it's put on the November ballot? Um, based on their letter, they did not indicate that they would be open to any amendments, so I don't believe that would be allowed. Okay. Ma'am? Yes, Larry. Something? That's where I was coming from on this, is I would like to present the best possible product to the people out there in a referendum. I do not believe that, that the ordinance as it stands is the best possible product to convince people uh, that this is the way we should go. So give me direction. There's really no further direction for the council to take. If the initiating committee <clears throat> wished to withdraw this letter and wished to do something more, they can send us a revised version, but it's really in their hands at this point. They've uh, fulfilled all of their duties as outlined in the charter, and you guys have taken a vote. So um, we're just on to the next item now okay. on the agenda. Thank you very much. I think it's time for a break. Back to finish up this meeting. We appreciate that tremendously. And with that, we will move on to our regular agenda. And the first item on our regular agenda is a presentation of the destination marketing organization and year end report. And our um, pres vice president of the destination marketing organization, Diane Bays, will be making the presentation today. Welcome. Well, thank you. Good morning, Mayor, City Council, leadership, and citizens. Glad to be here uh, to share some great news about our year end of 2021. First, why the name change? We were a Convention and Visitors Bureau. That's what we've always been known as. Um, in our industry, that is a confused statement for a lot of people. They don't know what that means. And so what we really do in our organization is market the destination. Therefore, we changed the name to Destination Marketing Organization. We promote and market local attractions, accommodations, transportation, retail stores, restaurants, events, and meetings and conventions, as well as offering tourism services. Is there anything you don't promote? <laughs> <laughs> Not the, we don't promote the bad news. Okay. <laughs> and that's, you know, that I say we are really the luckiest people in the world. We get to only talk about the good things happening in a community, yeah. and that is a great thing to do. Our mission is to enhance the quality of life for the citizens of San Angelo through destination marketing and promotion. So we do promote, usually through our social media, you will see our, um, our activities and our promotions locally, but the majority of our, locally, our, our, our marketing is done outside of the city limits. We wanna bring visitors here, and here's the reason why. We are fully funded by hotel tax. So visitors pay for everything we do. So visitors are extremely important to our organization. You hear the phrase heads and beds, that is part of who we are, but that's not all. Just to give you an idea, uh, we're fully funded by the portion of the 7% local hotel tax dollars. The rest of those funds are distributed throughout the city by this council uh, to make sure that they are meeting the criteria that the, the law for hotel tax is based on. It is a designated fund. Criteria number one, first, every expenditure must directly enhance and promote tourism and the convention and hotel industry. And number two, every expenditure of the hotel occupancy tax must clearly fit into one of nine statutory provided categories for expenditure of local hotel occupancy tax revenues. We do not get any of the retail sales tax that those visitors pay. So keep that in mind that those tax dollars go into the general fund. So thank you visitors, we appreciate you helping pay for police and fire and other opportunities. <clears throat> Wanna talk a little bit about our bookings that we had through our sales team last year. Uh, it, while it was a slower year, uh, we, were, we were doing well. We, um, in 2020, we canceled 100 meetings and events in March right after COVID. And then unfortunately we got Delta, dealt to us, if you will, in 2021. And we were still able to have 47 meetings on the books. So that while that is about a little under half of what we normally would get, the meetings are coming back. However, they've changed, they've become more of a combination of a hybrid meeting. So they will have some virtual 
and some in-person with the virtual also components. So we're having to readjust to what that looks like. These are just a few, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, no, I'll ask my question. These are just a few samples of the definite bookings we had in 2021. I share this because I want you to see the variety of hats our staff has to wear in order to get bookings into our community. We had the Earth Moving Contractors Association, the Southern Rolling Plains Cotton Growers, the Associated Press Managing Editors, the Southwest, Southwest Council of Agribusiness, Veterinary Medical, Water Utilities, Catholic Women's, uh, conference, Association of School Administrators, Business Women's State Conference, and the State Park Promotions Team Summer Meeting. Those are just a few of the examples. What was the largest one of that group? The largest, oh gosh. Um, Got to be the school administrators. I, I, would, I would think it would have been. I, unfortunately, I don't have that data in front of me. We also have, of course, the visitor center. So we manage the visitor center and I wanted to share this information. Now these are strictly the people who actually sign in and come into our visitor center. So this all, all absolutely does not represent all of those people, but last year 4,275 people came into our visitor center. Those top Texas cities, San Antonio, Austin, Abilene, Houston, Midland, Odessa, Dallas, Fort Worth, El Paso, and Lubbock. And then you see the other states. And we even had some international visitors. Normally that is a bigger number, uh, the 77 we had. We normally do Goodfellow tours. Unfortunately, we put those on pause for a couple of years. We shot a video instead so that they at least have a place, uh, something to see to show what there is to see and do when they're here but we uh, expect that number will increase in the next uh, few years. They, we do know that they wanna bring it back. And so we hope we can get those tours back so that we can help educate the good fellow uh, people while they're here. Print and digital, and I know I put Pandora in here, so also sound, I, I recognize that Pandora is not uh, print or digital. But in 2021, we were in 31 print publications and 10, on 10 tourism websites. So our print went down a bit from last year, or, or from 2020, but we were more present digitally, and we felt that was really important to do that. We've seen those trends, and so we want to continue to make sure we're, we're everywhere when we're, when we're on our um, marketing. Some of those include Austin Monthly, and I've, I've shared the distribution as well as uh, the frequency. Austin Monthly, Authentic Texas Magazine, which is done through the, the Heritage Trail system. It's a program they offer, and it's a, a quarterly publication. Brand USA Global Inspiration Program. You may think, why would we be in that? That is the U.S. Travels Marketing Magazine. It is in 15 countries and nine languages. So we work with Brand USA through Travel Texas which is a part of the office of the governor. We want to make sure that we are getting that message out. We do go to both Mexico and Canada on sales calls with Travel Texas. So the next step would be to make sure that we are in those magazines when those planners see that information. Certified folder rack card distribution. Last year, we distributed 120,000 rack cards. Majority of those are in Texas. This year, we just printed and delivered 150,000 rack cards that will be not only in Texas, but also in the shoulder states because we felt it was really important that that information was going into New Mexico, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and those, those other states. Pandora, we are on a, uh, an Austin Blues channel on Pandora. So we are, we are marketing the fact that our bottlenecks are better than theirs. You're not stuck in traffic in San Angelo. You can get anywhere in just about 15 minutes. It's gone very, very well on that, that station. Ride Texas, that is strictly a motorcycle magazine, uh, but we, want, we like the idea of taking the cyclist off of 20 and 10 and bringing them down the middle when they're coming east. Um, especially out of that Austin, San Antonio area through the Hill Country. San Antonio Magazine, Shop Across Texas. If you saw recently, I sent out a press release that eight stores were named best of by the readers of Shop Across Texas. We are very active with that organization in getting those stores added to, uh, to their inventory for votes by their readers. Texas Country Reporter. Everybody knows Bob Phillips and Kelly Phillips. Everybody loves them. And so we have been a top Texas town through them that is also carried on RFD-TV nationally. 
and then of course the Texas Forts Trail Region website. Texas Meeting Planner Guide, we have to get that information out to those planners so that our sales team can sell meetings and they will know who we are. So we are also in that Mid Texas Midwest Community Network Annual Guide that is mostly in this region, uh, but we work with, at, at that time, Kathy Keene uh, to, to get in their, their publication. Texas Monthly, Texas Parks and Wildlife Annual Guide with a state park in our community is important that we're in there. The Texas Sports Facility Guide with the facilities that we have to offer for sports teams, yet another market for us. We want to make sure they know about them. The Texas State Travel Guide is distributed by the Governor's Office of Travel Tourism and through uh, Economic Development and Tourism. 700,000 copies of that are distributed and when Travel Texas goes outside of the state and the nation, they take that guide with them. Travel Host West Texas, Travel Texas, which is actually a website uh, that is the governor's office website to promote Texas travel. True West Magazine, and we'll talk a little bit about more about that success in a bit. Visit the USA Global Inspiration Guide. Again, this is part of Brand USA and, and uh, promoting through US travel. Do they give uh -oh. you the details in terms of who subscribes to them and where they have the biggest impact from their guide? Do, what are their results? Yes, we, we get those results and we can see pockets of where that is distributed throughout. So we get those reports. So you see that we get an impact here in San Angelo from the visittheusa.com and visit the USA Global Inspiration Guide? Yes, uh, that is something, uh, it, it's actually a really interesting thing to talk about. It, and I'll tell you where we get most of the commentary from the media. Um, and part of that is because we also attend an event called IPW. We will be in um, um, Orlando this year. It will be in San Antonio for the first time in 22 years next year. So we're gonna have a big presence there. But that, that brings in 600 media from around the world. So we want to be there. We want them, when they are touring Texas and talking about coming to Texas, we want San Angelo to be front and center for that. What's the number one thing they look for? The number one thing, it depends on who they are and where they're from. Uh, you know, the, the German market, the, the Asian market, they're all different depending on what they want. Some want the arts, some want the, the cowboy culture, some want the nature, and, and, and we have all of that. So we're, we're pretty well-rounded for what the international traveler is looking for. Now, this is something I like to talk about, and, and a, a lot of people might not be familiar with earned media, so I did put a definition. Earned media is defined as the unpaid coverage or mention of you or your brand or organization by third party entities such as media publications, custom, customers, or influencers. And our earned media, we had some role in every one of these articles. We were either interviewed or provided, provided photography, or they, they just talked to us about our community to write these, these stories. So they cost us nothing. And you know How do we, we get more of that. I, we will. We will get more of that. We get a, a pretty pretty good amount every year. So True West Magazine uh, was best of the best um, in uh, 2021. 20, True West Magazine top Western towns. We were number two in, uh, last year. Now Magazine. It was an artful inspiration. Talked about our arts uh, here in our community. Small market meetings. I was interviewed by their writers there to add some Texas flair to your meetings. So we talked about meetings. Texas Town and City, San Angelo embraces the de designation Visual Arts Capital of Texas. Got to be interviewed for that. Texas Monthly, we talked about air race coming. Texas Highways, the perfect pair. I can't remember what that article was. Uh, Texas Highways, Bean to Barn, that was about Cowboy Up Chocolates. I'll go back, when is the air, air race one coming back? We are not sure now. That has been on hold and uh, there were sponsorship challenges uh, just simply because of COVID. So we are still kind of waiting to So hear. not this year? And not that we are aware. The Austin American Statesman. Um, I'm, I'm gonna point this out. You'll see a number of Austin American Statesman statement articles. That was for the press editors when they came here. He 
he loves San Angelo out of Austin. And so he wrote teasers before he got here and teasers when he was here. And then, and then he wrote articles afterwards. So we got a lot of press just for hosting a meeting. So that's really important for, for the citizens to know. We hosted a meeting and they wrote about it. That's always a good thing. Um, a, a lot of these are, are about art, about what we have to offer. Um, Adeline Reporter, Texas Highways again, Travel Awaits, How to Spend a Gorgeous Weekend in, in Beautiful San Angelo. What's not to love about that? The Hotel Guide named us one of the top te 10 Texas cities. And so that, that earned media is really important to us because we didn't, again, have to pay for it. And coming from an outside audience, it's always good for someone to talk about it. And let's uh, have another meeting and invite the Austin American Statesman guy if he's going to write that. There you money. go. <laughs> well, I just say that you ought to interview each and every one up here on this council and hear from us what we think are the greatest things about San Angelo and see how much press we get from that. There we go. I can do that. Uh, public relations, we submitted the application for consideration for top 10 Western Town for 2021. Uh, please know that you will not be considered if an application is not sent to them. So we have to put the application out in order for us to be considered. Last year, we were ranked number two. I know we're talking about 2021, but this year we brought back the title of number one. And this is the past four years, we've submitted the applications and we've been either the number one or the number two city four years in a row. So that is a, a great uh, feather in the cap of our community and those businesses who embrace the Western heritage. We created the paperwork submission and testified to legislators to have San Angelo named the Visual Arts Capital of Texas through 2031. Governor Abbott- it Says uh, in, uh, through 31, so for 10 years, correct? Uh, that's correct, that's correct. So we are, playing off of that pretty well, and we're going to continue to do that. I'd like to know how we make sure we use that to draw people in October when they go to Marfa for their annual trip to see how great the art is in Marfa when we have a much bigger art community here. Well, they're Marfa, all coming Texas. from the east, or majority of yes, them are, are, so we can draw them in that way. Uh, we submitted paperwork for the inaugural travel awards, uh, Texas Travel Awards, to consider San Angelo as destination of the year, and we won. Uh, beating other large cities, some of those big five or big six cities, and we're proud of that fact. And then, of course, we have the creation of a San Angelo Savings Pass. We offer a San Angelo Visitor Savings Pass, and we created a co Coffee Trail Savings Pass that launched in January. There are six businesses who participate in that Savings Pass, and we've already seen a, a couple of dozen at least uh, people who've used it. And so we're still working on it, um, and we're creating a mini, mini art gallery trail as well. So those are going to continue. We want to work with the businesses who have some something we can get them in the door with. And so we want to, of course, always have the visitor use them and even the, the locals use them so that they can frequent them. Great more, idea. more PR uh, efforts. Um, I, I was interviewed for state and national magazines. I was interviewed for True West Magazine for our Top Western Town article, Texas Town and City for embracing the designation for visual arts capital of Texas. The Texas Town and City Magazine goes to city leadership and elected officials and county officials all over the state. So that was good exposure for our community for those, those folks as well. And then San Angelo Lifestyles and Abilene Living Magazine, as many of you may know, I did do a, a perimeter tour in June 2020. For some reason, it keeps making, um, making the rounds. And so I uh, got to talk about that, how we started in San Angelo, ended in San Angelo, and then we saw the whole state. And then at, uh, San Angelo was represented at consumer meeting trade shows. We go to a number of trade shows. Uh, Christian Meetings and Conventions Association, Connect Texas, and Destination Texas are all association planners, as well as Southwest Showcase. The State Fair of Texas, our friends at the Texas Forts Trail represent us there. The Texas Country Reporter Festival, uh, Suzanne and I went there, and uh, Bob and Kelly gave us prime uh, real estate right by the stage, so we got to see a whole lot of people at that event. The U.S. Travel IPW, I talked about that earlier. I was in Las Vegas last year. We're going to Orlando, and then we'll be in San Antonio. And then the Winter Texan Expo down in McAllen. And additionally, we launched four Our, Our Bottlenecks Are Better Than Theirs videos. We utilized by the stream media here in town. Uh, they did ads, print ads for us, and they also did videos that have gotten a lot of real, real great play and, and, and really are fun to watch. 
two shows aired on Texas Country Reporter. Uh, another, the Perimeter Tour was picked up in January, but Art and Common Places was highlighted in May. And then the Farwell Kites, an ASU professor was interviewed for that. And I want to just give you a background, background on that. When I was doing the Texas Perimeter Tour with Bob and his team, they, they interviewed us in Farwell. And these kites, these birds, were jumping all over us. We didn't know what they were, and they were pretty amazing. And it turns out an ASU professor knew about the kite, so that followed up with a new interview from um, ASU. So we got, we got double play off of that. And then we hosted a travel influencer, 18 Things to Do in San Angelo for Romantic Getaway. Christina has a large following, and we were able to take advantage of that. As far as our social media efforts in 2021, we saw a 157% increase on our page views on our website, a 9% increase in Facebook followers, a 3% increase on Twitter, 26% in increase in Instagram, 30% in increase in views on YouTube. Unfortunately, we had a decrease in Pinterest, so we're gonna beef that right back up. And then we had a 74% increase on LinkedIn. We've been more active on LinkedIn because that is a business location for people to read about us. So we're also working now with Economic Development to share some of their stories on our destination, our Discover San Angelo page, in order to get more good news out about our city. Once it's posted on LinkedIn, how do we know that that post resulted in any activity within the city? We can see the analytics. Uh, we, we don't know that. We just know that we're sending out PR that is good PR about our community. But we don't know if they've come here afterwards unless they actually tell us that in a post. So occupancy and average daily rate comparison, this is kind of hard to see, but, um, and I didn't put it in those blue colors. It just did that when I transferred it over. So I don't, I don't know why I did it. But I wanted to share what the occupancy looked like. In 2021, our occupancy was 57%. We strived to have 60. We didn't get there. 55% uh, in 2020 and 64% in 2019. So we lost, a, a, it's about a 10% decrease since 2019 pre-COVID. That said, I believe we would have hit that 60% mark uh, because one of our hotels, which is one of our larger hotels, was struck by lightning in August. And it has, the inventory for that hotel has not come back and will not come back till the end of March. So Didn't it was, those people have an option to stay in one of those other hotels in that same area? They did, but if they don't have the meeting space and they, were, they would be utilizing some of that meeting space in that property as well, they did not all stay there. And so we did lose a significant amount of dollars for that in occupancy as well. So we feel as soon as that property gets back up and we'll see the numbers and we feel confident it will happen. And then of course we have American getting ready to open, I think at the end of this month. And so we'll have another property online, which will be helpful. That said, the other news on that is average daily rate is higher this year than it has been in the past three years. It's $79 on average. Uh, in 2020, it was 70, and in 2019, it was 77. So people are paying to come. We just didn't have as many people come. So that helps balance it out a little bit. I couldn't give you the number, uh, Councilman Thomas, uh, for 2021, because we don't have those numbers yet. We won't know those until probably June. However, this is why travel and tourism is important to our community and the visitor coming to our community. If not for visitor spending in 2020, which I'll give you, every household would have to pay an additional $549 in taxes annually. You'll notice that we were seeing a big increase in that pre-COVID. So we're gonna see that number come back up and we hope to someday hit at least 700. I will tell you, at, uh, we were recently at the Unity Dinner for the travel and tourism industry in Houston, and the number in Texas on average is 740. I would love to hit that number someday, but I think 549 is pretty respectable. So that's it for me. I'd be happy to answer any questions. You do yes, good Kim. work, Diane. Thank you. you do. Do we have questions from council? No. I have a question. How are we going to maximize the visual capital of Texas? Because that's a fantastic effort that you put in getting us that, and it's so appreciative of it. So how do we maximize that? 
Well, when we are doing a lot of it with our advertising, so we're focusing on that. We do have a brand for Visual Arts Capital of Texas, so we're putting that information out in our marketing efforts. We are also doing that with our PR efforts. Susanna will be going to LA next week and then New York at the end of the month, and we, that, those meetings are with media. So we are going to be telling that story there so that everyone knows that's who we are because that designation is important. These designations as a whole are important for the quality of life. To be able to sell to a community, this is what you can see and do in this community. And if you, uh, if you saw my slide, if I can get it back. Whoops, I'm not there yet. It's not on there. I thought I had another slide. It all starts with a visit. If they don't visit, they won't consider moving. They won't consider moving a, a business here. We need to get them here. So again, we go after those designations like Visual Arts Capital of Texas um, and also True West uh, number 10 or number one True Western town in the US. We bring that information out there and the more designations we can find, the better we look on paper to people looking to move a business or relocate or come here for jobs. And so we're gonna be doing that more through our PR and our marketing efforts. How about the music friendly designation? How are we maximizing that? We are now in a new process of planning with that. And so we are looking at different opportunities to to talk about our music industry. One of the things we're looking at doing is creating banners that musicians who play in other communities can take that say San Angelo. So that when they go to other locations in their backdrop, when they're playing, San Angelo will be on the backdrop so that they will see who we are. So that is a, that's one of our efforts. There are, there are so many opportunities. We have our film friendly designation. We did our, our first live film festival last year. We're working very closely with uh, the San Angelo uh, Performing Arts Center about bringing in more movies so that we can show that we are film friendly. And How was the attendance last year? The to attendance the was low, but that said, we had 19 filmmakers from all over the country, and they said it was the best venue they've ever actually been to for a film festival in playing their shows. This year, we are going to offer incentive for those who, for the winner of the film festival. And we're still trying to, to market this out, but we want to offer incentive for them to come and film in San Angelo. They would be required to use some of our local actors, some of our uh, businesses when they purchase sets or whatever, they have to use the locals. But we want to be able to say, we are going to, to create a film inventory so that we can say we had films made in San Angelo. And that, that's independent filmmakers, and who knows where it will go from there. How do we get out to the public in San Angelo? Because um, we have some very talented people here in San Angelo that maybe consider themselves future filmmakers. How do we get the message out to them that they could help us in this effort of being a, 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 a movie um, friendly city. Sure. Well, one of the things we wanted to do last year, and we just couldn't do it based on the timing, but we wanted the film uh, festival coordinator who does the Austin Revolution Film Festival, the number one film festival on fr film freeway, which is huge. Um, I want to add that we had a thousand films submitted for our festival first year. It's a lot. So the interest is there, and because we're working with James uh, with the Austin Revolution Film Festival, he has already that market. And so we were going to have him and several of the filmmakers actually speak to the ASU students, filmmaking students. Unfortunately, we just couldn't make that happen last year, but th that is a priority this year to make that happen so that they know. We also work closely with the Film Commission, the Texas Film Commission. We're constantly talking to them about what opportunities there are to have filmmakers come here. So when we get those leads, we immediately answer them. If they're looking, for example, for a white church somewhere, we will go find a white church within driving distance where they'll stay here. And so we, we constantly are getting that information out that says we want to have them film. So if you have opportunities at the state, bring them here. Fantastic. I thank you for your being able to answer questions quickly because that tells you you really know your market and really know your information so it says a lot about your professionalism and your leadership and it is greatly appreciated thank you appreciate you any other comments or questions thank you diane <clears throat>
I'm going to move ahead and do item D and E because we have people in the audience uh, for the sidewalk ordinance. So I'd like to go ahead and move forward on that. Um, so you don't have to sit and wait a lot longer. If you don't mind, everybody. Is that okay? I'll go ahead, Mayor. Oh, I'm going to be here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Decker waited a little longer out there. John, you're on. Do we need to read the caption? Yes, or? please. I will do that. Sorry. <laughs> Got to get focused again. D, first reading and public hearing of an ordinance amending Chapter 12, Planning and Development, Exhibit C, Land Development and Subdivision Ordinance, Chapter 9, Land Development and Subdivision Design Policies, replacing it in its entirety, Section V, Sidewalks, and amending Chapter 3 definitions. John, you're on. Thank you. Uh, John James, Director of Planning Development Services. I'm going to go through these first slides pretty quickly, but it's just a little bit of background on how we got to this point. Uh, the city does have a comprehensive plan that lays out the future of the community, uh, and it has a number of items referenced in there for uh, making the city more pedestrian and bicycle friendly uh, and talking about walkable communities, and sidewalks is one of the ways to do that. Uh, the city's parks plan also references uh, ensuring that there's sidewalk connectivity uh, in neighborhoods to parks. Um, the San Angelo housing study that was just done a couple of years ago talks about uh, home buyers' preferences for sidewalks and uh, that some in some neighborhoods, some uh, folks uh, would prefer sidewalks. Now, you'll notice that when we get to the sidewalk actual, the details, uh, we've not recommended sidewalks uh, in single family. The thing I say about people taking these surveys is most surveys are loaded questions are loaded and they say would you like a sidewalk well the answer is going to be yes would you like a sidewalk if it costs you ten thousand dollars more that question's not asked just sure. to be sure we're clear well and we do, in a second we do have a response to a survey that did ask a similar question uh, to that but uh, uh, angelo state and the mpo worked together back in 2013 to ask some similar questions and again uh, the majority of people did want to see more sidewalks in the community. They didn't ask a lot of specifics on where uh, they should be, and so that was a lot of the details that we've worked out over the past couple of years. Uh, and similarly, the large support for more sidewalks, and what does that mean exactly, uh, is, is kind of part of the debate. Would you like a sidewalk? Oh, yeah. Would you like to pay more for it? Oh, I didn't know I was going to have to. Well, and here's a question that the MPO did a survey back in 2016, and they did ask that question, would the community benefit from new sidewalks? And 75% said yes. Uh, would you support taxes to pay for those sidewalks? And again, that number was 63%. That or would, would you rather have that. that money spent on the streets? And that question wasn't asked, but 63% did say yeah. they would spend money yeah. uh, to get more sidewalks. Uh, they were asked where they wanted to see sidewalks. Uh, a lot of people just said everywhere. Uh, some people said neighborhoods and residential areas. You know what I find interesting about that is the number of criticisms and angry mail and angry phone calls I have gotten considering all of those sidewalks that have gone up and down Bryant Boulevard and Knickerbocker, and everybody's mad and angry as, mm, because those sidewalks were put out there. So I'm confused about the messaging here. Well, I would say we do hear from folks who think those sidewalks are helpful, and we do see people walking on them. So there, I think there are elements on both sides that see the benefits, but also, obviously, as you mentioned, some people don't think it was a good uh, investment on those streets. They would rather we spend it on our streets, mm -hmm. um, most of them that I heard from anyway. Again, some of this information is in your background, so I'm going to skip through it, but there are some national surveys from the AARP that also talks about people's uh, desires for more sidewalks, uh, as well as the National Association of Realtors that found that uh, communities with sidewalks uh, do see higher values and homes sell quicker. Um, and just a note that uh, in and around schools, you'll notice that that's one of the areas where we've recommended sidewalks. Um, somewhere between 10 and 35 percent of students walk to school depending on the school. So it, some schools it's lower, some schools it's, it's higher, up to a third of students who actually walk uh, to school. We did look at other cities as we normally do. We looked at the 50 largest cities in the, in the state. Uh, San Angelo and Waco are the only two that don't require sidewalks in, in most new development. Um, as with many of those cities, 
ordinances, we have proposed a number of exceptions to where sidewalks would not be required. Uh, and you'll see both rural areas, industrial areas, uh, and uh, existing neighborhoods uh, as well. Um, skip over that one. Uh, just a, a brief summary of the ordinance. Uh, sidewalks are already triggered. The, the process that triggers sidewalks are uh, subdivision plats, replats, and site plans, and that will continue to be the case. Um, as I noted, in most cases, new single-family homes won't require sidewalks, but in the limited cases they will, uh, those can be deferred, so they won't have to be built uh, with the road at the subdivision plat. They could be delayed until the home is actually built. Um, sidewalks would be required on uh, major collectors and arterial streets, so the larger streets, um, and this ordinance does establish a process for waivers or deviations. So if there are particular unique examples of where sidewalks would be required, but uh, for whatever reason may not be appropriate for that area, there is basically a variance process uh, to uh, ask for not having to do that. Is this what we currently have or is this what you're proposing? No, this is the proposed ordinance. Um, so as I mentioned uh, earlier, sidewalks would generally not be required on local streets and minor collectors. That's something that throughout this process, working with the Development Task Force, as well as the recommendation of the Planning Commission, uh, that was really one of the big sticking points is, do we require sidewalks for new uh, single-family home developments? And so the, the ordinance that comes to you today from the Planning Commission has recommended not requiring sidewalks in those uh, single-family residential areas. But it would require sidewalks in some of these other areas, the, the downtown, uh, multifamily, so apartment areas, as well as commercial areas, uh, any, any uh, area that's designated on a safe routes to school plan, for example, uh, in and around schools, um, and in certain areas where sidewalks already exist. So we do have some neighborhoods where there are sidewalks, if somebody builds something in those areas, they would also have to put in a sidewalk. But if they take that sidewalk out and just plant a new lawn, what happens? Well, under this ordinance, they would be required to replace it. Um, and so if you can't, you, if there's a sidewalk constructed on your property, you couldn't just take it out without Even getting approval. Even if it's like this? Well, they also the property owners would have to maintain the sidewalks at, on their properties as well uh, moving forward. Uh, the ordinance does also require sidewalks within 300 feet of, of commercial areas, parks, schools, and churches. Um, and I just included this because the ordinance does make sidewalks uh, required, uh, either required or not required based on street classification. So these are just some examples of, uh, as we went through this process, we got questions, well, what is a major arterial or what's a minor collector? Um, and I've also got a map if there are questions just uh, of the city showing which streets are major arterials, which Go are back to that other screen. Collectors. Okay, so what we know is on Bryant and Knickerbocker, tech stop paid for those sidewalks. That's correct. The city didn't. No, that's correct. But if, uh, if there are parts where TxDOT hasn't constructed a sidewalk and a new development's going in, they would also have to put in a sidewalk. Or on some of the city streets like College Hills or Southwest Boulevard, those would also require sidewalks if when new development happens. Uh, I'll point out that this doesn't require anybody to go out and do anything on their property today unless they're going through a development process for some new development uh, or redevelopment on the property. So no one will have to go out tomorrow and put in a sidewalk uh, unless they're developing. So um, staff does recommend this uh, ordinance this uh, before you, as did the Planning Commission uh, by a vote of five to one at their January 24th meeting. I don't think I included it on a slide, but this has gone through our development task force uh, at least five times. Um, and uh, this, uh, I believe this recommendation uh, of this ordinance comes to you with the full support of the development community as well. Questions from council? Tommy, uh, Tom. John, you, there's one Please. in there. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, you're on. All right, thank you. Tommy will take second. Uh, cool. So um, you talked about 300 feet within a church. I mean, churches can pop up anywhere. I don't want the developers to put in something and be at risk of a, a site popping up. And, I mean, we had one on agenda just two weeks ago that popped up. How do we deal with that to protect them? Well, the church would have to be there. So if a church comes in later... Uh, that wouldn't change anything for the All properties around it. Uh, again, unless they then later come in to develop or redevelop something new. That's the only question I have. 
Tommy, did you have? I did not know. No, I, I just was. I, I, I was embarrassed <laughs> being compared to Tom. Yeah. <laughs> get it's back. Okay. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. It could have been worse. I, it could I have been a you. Uh, It's just how we yeah, roll. John, I just wanted to ask you. So this doesn't have anything to do if we wanted to. See, I'm still fighting to to build the sidewalk from Gregory Street all the way down. We have a game plan. Yes. Okay. That's. This isn't going to matter. This isn't going to have anything to do with it then. That's right. Any sidewalk that the city uh, the city goes out and builds as part of a street project or a separate sidewalk project isn't affected by this. That's right. Okay, so with that, I would say I need a motion for approval of item D as presented. So move. So moved by Tom E and seconded by <laughs> Harry E. And Thomas. we will now hear from the public. Morning, Council. Uh, Brian Benson, owner of Clearview Custom Homes, as well as I uh, have the privilege of being president of the Home Builders of uh, San Angelo Association. Uh, just here, wanted to uh, just let you guys know that that you know sidewalk ordinance sounds like it's simple, but as as John just explained in this, uh, this has been basically a two-year uh, meeting and and collaboration with. Um, the building task force, planning commission, uh, so, some subcommittees that we have uh, in the development um, community, as long as city staff. And we want to thank city staff for working with us, coming together on this. Um, as we see San Angelo growing and having potential in the future for this, this is something we're going to have to do, uh, hopefully a lot, uh, work with us uh, and, and you guys and, uh, and come together. And we did this. And I uh, just want to let you guys know that we're uh, full approval of this ordinance. What I want you all to know is that we understand that you are our future. Without more homes and affordable homes at whatever price an affordable home is based off of someone's income, we support what you do. We have a tax base that is primarily made up of residential tax dollars, not commercial or industrial. So our hope to grow our tax base is on your shoulders. You carry the weight. So we need you to keep building. And we need you to be able to build homes customers want, where they want to live, and at the price they can afford. So we want you to know that we support your work, your efforts, and what you bring to the table for economic development. Because if we don't have homes, no one wants to move here. If we don't have homes, no business wants to come here. Housing is a primary issue as it relates to our ability to continue to grow as a city. So I thank you for what you do. Thank you. And like I said, again, thank you guys for working with us and hope to keep doing it in the future to make San Angelo a better place. Thank you. Good morning. Russell with SKG Engineering. Um, thank you for the motion for this. However, we would would like to kind of ask that, that we put something to before you to reconsider this and add maybe to the motion. As we've read through this ordinance for the umpteenth time, you read it and you read it and you talk to developers and you get their input and you learn and you read it some more and, and you go through a planning commission. And, and so, you know, there's just a few things, really two things I believe that, that we would like to have added back in. Um, one of those, um, for, in a specific, and, and I don't know if this is sidewalk or sidewalk and streets that we're really talking about sidewalks. just sidewalks yes, only so so really don't have much specific to the sidewalks um, but as we get maybe to the street width before and this is a sidewalk ordinance so really discussing street widths right now I don't believe it will be that next item here it'd be the next item so on this particular item in this motion and second is with sidewalks only the issues relative to streets is in the next item and you'll be glad we'll be glad to have you come forward and speak at that point okay thank thank you for that and the, the clarification there but i do want to just ask that before we have a motion or maybe you can come back and amend your motion on the streets because we want to talk about some specific items there but but we do fully support the sidewalks there's some street stuff that we'll talk about when we get to the streets thank you Morning. I'm Steve Eustace. I'm a commercial broker and developer here in San Angelo and don't have any comments about the residential part, but I did want to ask a couple of questions about the commercial. Uh, John, does this every level of commercial John? Oh, does every level of commercial zoning more required sidewalks? 
CN, for example? What are you asking? What CN? Uh, com neighborhood commercial. Yeah, the lattice, make, so the public knows what you're asking. I, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, all levels of commercial zoning, would manufacturing fall under that? Yes, com all, all levels of commercial zoning, including neighborhood commercial, would require sidewalks. But as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, there is an exemption for uh, industrial um, areas. So manufacturing, lot industrial, those kinds of zonings would not require sidewalks on local streets or minor collectors. Uh, all major streets would still require sidewalks. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. sure does. Thank you. Uh, and just one other question or comment. Uh, we have always, John's always worked with us on deferring sidewalks in commercial platting to the building permit stage. And, but that's always required a special request for that exemption. Is this automatic that we can defer putting in sidewalks until the building's being built or we still have to go for special request. Yes, as this ordinance is written, it would allow for that uh, basically an automatic deferral. The only exceptions to that are what we call non-developable areas. So uh, if you're doing a subdivision, for example, and there's a detention pond or a um, you know, something adjacent to a railroad, well, the railroad track's not a good example, but if there are areas that won't have subsequent development on them in the future, then the sidewalks would have to be constructed with He's the street. He's asking commercial. Yeah, any so. commercial property um, would be automatically eligible or automatically deferred. Um, there is a development agreement required. They would have to sign basically agreeing to do it in the future because uh, some elements of state law require certain things to be done at the subdivision plat stage. Um, so that's where our authority comes from to require the sidewalks in certain circumstances. And so we just require the developer to agree to do it in the future just so we have that. We basically extend that authority to the development stage or the building stage. So, but short answer is yes, that would be deferred. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be having that. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I support the, the ordinances presented. And I also want to say thanks to staff for just always being there to listen. There was some pretty heated meetings sometimes, and I think John always acted like a gentleman, and I appreciate it. Further public comment? Seeing none, we will take a vote. All in favor of passing item D as read and presented, please say aye. 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 Are there any nays? With no nays, this passes seven to one. I mean, seven to zero. Can't, my, my, my counter's yeah. off. Yeah. Item E, first why are you reading. against it, Daniel? <laughs> what did you say? I said, why are you against it, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's good. <clears throat> With a flag jacket. Item E, first reading and public hearing of an ordinance amending Chapter 12, Planning and Development Exhibit C, Land Development and Subdivision Ordinance, Chapter 10, Construction Standards and Specifications, Section 3, Widths and Graphic Specifications, replacing in its entirety subsection A, Widths and amending Chapter 3, Definitions. And John, you're on again. Thank you. This is kind of a companion piece. Um, a couple of reasons that we're looking at cha changing the street widths, both the pavement width that has to be constructed as well as the right-of-way width, which is the, the land including adjacent to the, the pavement itself. Uh, we get a lot of variance requests for street widths, so uh, especially on existing streets. Uh, maybe there's an existing street out there that's 32 feet wide, but the ordinance says it has to be 36 or 40 feet wide, um, and the developer doesn't want to have to go out and just add two or three feet to the edge of a road. Uh, and, uh, of course, a lot of those are approved as well. So we wanted to take a look at uh, should we modify the requirements of, of those and narrow the widths in some cases, uh, and that's what this proposal would do. This also has been to the Development Task Force a number of times, and as, as Russell mentioned, there's a, maybe a couple of tweaks they're going to mention, but for the most part, this is supported uh, by the development community. And as you present this to us, can you tell us where the tweets are along yes. this so we understand them? Well, at least, at least the ones I know of. Okay. Um, 
Uh, so this does basically three major things. One is it decreases the pavement width uh, for most street classifications. And I won't read through all of these, but you can see here uh, as an example for a minor arterial, the pavement width would go from 64 uh, to 56 feet. So that's if a developer's going out and building a brand new road, instead of 64 feet, it, it could be constructed at 56 feet. Um, I'll note on minor collector and local streets, uh, staff had originally recommended narrowing those more as well, uh, but the Planning Commission uh, chose not to follow that recommendation and to keep the streets a little wider. And in part, that has to do with the decision on sidewalks, because um, part of the reason our streets are so wide is that years ago, the city decided we're not going to require sidewalks, uh, but to ensure that there's a safe place for people to walk, we're going to make the roads a little wider to give that edge of the street uh, where people could walk um, at least presumably somewhat more safely a little farther away from traffic. And so the majority of the Planning Commission felt that if we're not going to require sidewalks on those local and minor collector streets, they wanted to keep them a little wider as well. Um, but they also did leave in um, our current ordinance requirement that you can go narrower on those streets if you provide a sidewalk. So a sidewalk's not required, but so for example on a local street, uh, it would require a 40 foot wide street, which is our current standard, but if you're willing to do a sidewalk on at least one side of the street, you could go down to 36. Again, that's our current standard in our current ordinance, and that's what the recommendation that's coming to you from the Planning Commission recommends. What, what happens if you're in Lakeview and most of the streets in Lakeview were built at a much narrower width? So how do we approach that and does this ordinance address that? It does. In fact, that's, I said there were three things this does. That's the third one and I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, before I get off of this slide, this is the one of the things that um, I think Russell was, was going to come and ask you. Um, because we had proposed narrowing the streets, we basically eliminated the separate rural street standard that allowed rural streets to be more narrow. Um, but with the Planning Commission saying, no, we want to keep them a little wider, uh, there's a possible need to add back in that separate provision for rural streets. And define a rural street for us. Uh, it's basically any street in an area where the lots are over an acre. Uh, so that's largely ETJ development outside the city limits. But it is some areas, like uh, like on the north side, uh, there are some areas where there are large lots uh, as well. So basically, on the north side, there's also just the issue of those roads, streets were initially created much narrower. In fact, they've even become more narrow because of the overgrowth of weeds and grass onto those streets. Which, if you looked at the street width in terms of the drivable piece of that street width, would be even narrower. Yeah, and again, that's, a, that's an element that this ordinance does address uh, as well. So what we're talking about here is just the standard uh, for a brand new street. Developers going out and building it, here's what the standard's going to be. Uh, so staff, staff is recommending uh, adding back in that rural standard. And again, the, I guess the, when the Planning Commission made their motion to keep the wider streets, uh, that was just an unanticipated uh, impact um, that, that we didn't think of until after the meeting. And so... Uh, staff is supportive of adding that back in. Um, and so uh, the proposal keeps most right-of-way widths the same. That's the amount of space for the streets. But again, we get more area than just the pavement width because there's there's area for utilities and sometimes sidewalks and street lights and all of that kind of stuff is in that what we call the parkway, basically between the edge of pavement and the edge of the right-of-way. Um, and in a rural area, for example, there's a bar ditch or something sometimes. Um, but again, most of the right-of-way widths will stay the same, but we've recommended increasing them in a couple of cases for major arterials and major collectors. What we've found is in many cases there's just not enough room, uh, especially as we see you know, some of these underground uh, you know, fiber optic. Uh, we see more cellular, those small cellular kinds of things that can go into the right-of-way. You've got street lights, sidewalks, uh, fire What I'm confused about that. is aren't most of the major and minor streets already built? So um, I'm not sure how many more major or minors that we intend to build in this city, but it, we're changing something to increase the width of something that's already built. 
For the most part, yes. So this would apply largely to new areas, but we do have a lot of areas that are growing. Uh, Twin Mountain, for example, as growth continues, developers are building Twin Mountain uh, as that moves towards 67. Uh, so that'd be an example of where this might apply. It, but it also applies to redevelopment. So if, if, we, if we have a constricted area uh, and somebody's coming in to redevelop a large area, we often require them to dedicate an additional like five feet of, of right of way to get to this new standard. So again, back into Lakeview is a good example. So we're gonna go further and further into someone's lawn to get this land to do this? Well, it could be, but again, we've we've only recommended increasing the right of way for major arterials and major collectors. So it's it's the. And there aren't any roads. of those in Lakeview. Uh, there probably are some. Uh, again, those homes are typically built well back from the street. So uh, number one, we don't see a lot of redevelopment up there that requires replatting. But when we do, uh, if they had to give an additional five feet of the front of their property for an extra space on the roadway, that typically doesn't create a problem. Although I will mention... Well, so you say that. I want to know, does the uh, owner of the land think that? Well, it's it easy to say. It depends on the circumstances, but it, but there is a variance process to that as well. So, But then they have to file that well, at their expense? They're going through a... In order for this to apply in any case, they're already going through a subdivision plat process anyway. And so it's just asking for the variance through that same process. If all you're doing is two lots on a block and the rest of the houses are developed already. And what I was about to mention was that there is a variance process and in those cases where it's just one lot or two lots that are redeveloping, uh, those are almost always granted. Uh, if, if you've already got a pavement on a street that's existing, you've got the right of way that's existing, it usually doesn't make sense to ask for five or 10 feet from that, that property if only one or two are developing. On the other hand, if it's a major redevelopment in a commercial area, it often is a good idea to get that extra right of way because it may be needed uh, for water lines or you know whatever is going in. Um, so this typically wouldn't create a problem for uh, one of those redevelopment areas, um, which brings well, uh, th this brings us to the third element, which is existing streets. One of the things that our current ordinance doesn't do that this will do is create a minimum width that's smaller than the standard width. And that's largely for areas that are already developed and it's exactly the circumstance you mentioned. If you've got an already developed area and the street was only built to 30 feet wide, under our current ordinance, if they come in to redevelop, they have to widen that street to 36 or 40 feet wide uh, or ask for a variance from that. What this would do is say, no, if, if you've got an existing street out there uh, that's a certain width, it can largely stay at that width. Um, now, I will mention if it's below that minimum width, which is largely based on fire, fire lane requirements, which is 26 feet on a local street, if you're less than 26 feet, then you are going to have to widen it to that 26, um, largely to meet the fire truck, fire code standards. Um, but you wouldn't have to widen it to the 40 feet, uh, which is an accommodation for that circumstance of already existing developed areas. And so here's just a listing. Again, I won't read through all of them, but those minimum widths. Uh, so for example, on a local street, as I mentioned, if you're building a brand new local street, it's gonna have to be 40 feet. Uh, but if it's an existing, you can go down to as low as 26 feet. Um, well, all new subdivisions would be 40 feet. Uh, that's correct. That's, that's the recommendation of the Planning Commission. And that's our current ordinance standard as well. Um, so, for example, even a major arterial, we get redevelopments on major streets, and we're often having to either ask them for more pavement, more right-of-way, or they're having to seek a variance from that. This would be an automatic process. They wouldn't have to even ask for a variance. If they meet that minimum width, it would just be an automatic approval. Again, this is that same map in case there are questions about, well, what's an arterial, what's a collector, which streets does the, do those apply to? So this does come with a recommendation from staff for approval. Uh, as I mentioned, the Planning Commission also recommended approval by a 4-2 vote. Uh, but as I mentioned at the beginning, they did recommend keeping our current width standards for minor collectors and local streets instead of narrowing them uh, because of the not requiring the sidewalk on those streets. I think my biggest challenge is on the rural streets when you have um, a one acre or larger um, Plot, plots, plots 
lots. In a rural area, I'm not so sure we would want to maintain the same standard in a rural development as defined as a rural development versus a street within their traditional planned array. Well, and as I mentioned, that was the thing that Russell, I think, was going to speak to. Um, and staff is supportive of that request to to put back in the current rural standard, which would allow for 30 feet instead of 40 in those rural areas. I support that. Just a note that will need to be part of the motion uh, if that's the feeling of the council. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have. Other questions for John? No questions for John. Um, who through, who yes. to approve with the uh, addition of the 30 feet for the rural areas. Thank you, Harry. And may I have a second and a second by Tommy. Public comment, please. Uh, Ron Benson, uh, Clearview Custom Homes and president of the Home Builder Association of San Angelo. Uh, again, just on this note too, working with uh, city staff, we appreciate the collaboration and we are full approval of your motion with the adding of the rule uh, keeping that 30 feet. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment? My name is David Jensen. I'm a developer. Um, we've developed in the city some and then um, quite a bit out of the ETJ, um, Buffalo Heights and Cristobal and a few other areas. Um, I would like to uh, ask the <coughs> city council to consider um, going back to that uh, 36 foot with without sidewalks. Um, uh, that extra cost is going to cost the developer and the city a lot of money, and um, I really think that 36 feet is 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 sufficient. I think there was maybe some confusion early on on <coughs> um, a lot of the builders felt like. They would prefer to build 40 foot wide rather than 36 in a sidewalk. Um, but um, anyway, I'd like for the, the council to consider that. Um, and also, I guess Tom James has already talked about putting the 30 foot width in the ETJ. Um, we have uh, probably a large project we'll begin working on, <coughs> um, kind of catty corner from the bluffs on 2288 and, and uh, our node. <coughs> um, Having to uh, build the city standards in the ETJ is, is difficult, particularly on one acre tracks. Um, you know, you often have 150 foot road frontage, and um, at the cost of development, it just makes it almost impossible to develop one acre tracks um, and, and have to comply with the same, you know, city streets uh, requirements or whatever. So, I'd like, you know, for sure, I want to you know, second the putting back in the 30 foot width, but um, but in the city limits also consider that 36 foot rather than the 40 foot on the street width. Thank you. Russell Gully with SKG. I, I think I'm here on the right time now for, for this one. So appreciate the motion and adding in the 30 feet. Um, we would like to add back in, you know, not only kind of in hearing from developers, but as a taxpayer for the, the life cycle maintenance of streets. We, the developers put these streets in after the year warranty, the taxpayers are paying for the maintenance of that street for here on out. So. Uh, you know, we know the condition of the city streets of San Angelo. The engineering is doing a great job with what they can. So, so any opportunity we have to narrow a street and, and go from 40 to 30, if you know, that's that's as San Angelo grows, and, and now we're maintaining narrower streets. So, from a expenditure for the life of those streets, we're saving money there. So. Uh, I think there was a little confusion maybe early on. The developers and some people are thinking the requirement was if we go to 36 feet, then that triggers automatically we have to do a sidewalk because that was the current, that, that is the current standard today. But, but we were 
thinking and understanding uh, that maybe it was it, it's just going to a straight 36 foot wide street without the sidewalks where it qualifies per the sidewalk ordinance as proposed. So thank you for your consideration on this. Would be happy to answer any questions. John, can you review that information on this that they're referring to? I guess I'm not sure what information the- I think that I, if I understand it, establishing a 30, a 40 foot standard width of a street without a sidewalk versus 36 inch with a, without a sidewalk. Yes, the, and yeah, that's the current really standard. Good. So we're really talking about a local street here. Um, the, the original proposal uh, that staff had recommended the planning commission was that uh, the, the street be 36 feet wide. Um, Regardless of With sidewalk. or without a sidewalk. Um, the planning commission recommended keeping our current standard of 40 feet if you don't have a sidewalk but then still allowing the 36 with a sidewalk. So basically for a local street, keeping our current standard instead of the reduced width standard is what the planning commission recommended. So I will ask Harry if he would like to uh, restate his motion and add that it would be, of uh, the local street would be at 36 inches with a sidewalk, not the 40 inches. Let's say feet. I said inches. Oh, no. I'll correct that to feet. Okay. I just can't get down a 36 inch street, man. So sorry. I mean, that's what it's the been a long is. morning. That's what the ordinance is today. I'd rather keep it at the 40 feet. Okay, so the motion stays at this point as Harry presented it, as presented with the addition of the rural streets being reduced to 30 inches. Feet. <laughs> I need more coffee. Or maybe I've had too much coffee. All right, with that, uh, any further public comment? Rocky Templin, single member District 6. Um, my draft of this is dated July 30th of 2018. That's when this began. There is a lot of confusion on street width, sidewalks, where to, where not to, when, when to, when not to, when to deviate, when to defer. Uh, January 24th, the memo stated to the Planning Commission, whether to require sidewalks on minor collector streets and single family residential areas, the consensus of the commission was to require sidewalks on arterial streets as well as major collector streets in addition, the consensus was not to require sidewalks on local streets and single family areas. The staff needs direction from the commission on this to resolve the issue. Was that January of this year? It was January 24th of 2022. And so, so I think there was still some confusion that the 1959 code stated that you'd put in a 36 foot street, you'd put in a sidewalk. If not, you'd put in a 40 foot street and you did not have to put in a sidewalk. That's where that came from was 1959. So I think we're still at consensus. We've given and taken for four years. And so I think that's where we are on a local street and then a minor collector. A major collector is 50 to 48 feet and a minor collector is 50 to 48 feet. That's confusing in itself because they're two different collectors. And so, but you can take a minor collector and go down to 40 foot with a sidewalk. So if a local street is now gonna be 40 foot, then why can't I take it down to 30 foot and put in a sidewalk? Thank you. 30 or 36? 30. Well, I am confused. For the public comment, So the motion is to accept as presented with the addition of the change of rural street going from uh, 40 or 36 or 40, whichever it is, down to 30. 
And with that, we'll take a vote. All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 All those uh, disagreeing say nay. Nay. Okay, you want to vote again? No. Show of hands. No, it's six to one. Okay. <laughs> You're just going to try to change your mind. <laughs> I haven't. <clears throat> there was a time in my life where a blonde could do that. <laughs> <laughs> With that, we'll move on to item C. No, item B. B. Yes, Sorry, sir. item B. Good morning. I think it's still morning. This is regarding the Spring Creek Marina and the lease property, the property that Golden Antlers leases from the city for Spring Creek Marina. <clears throat> this is a copy of the current site plan, which exists in Amendment 1. And just to clarify things, we have the lease with Spring Creek Marina. Amendment 1 added this new property that's on the east end of Spring Creek Marina. And this exhibit is part of that lease amendment. Amendment 2. Uh, modified some language in the, the lease that took out the language regarding special events and it delayed the payment plan uh, based on the effects of the pandemic. Amendment 3 added a few parcels on the other side of the marina including the restroom. So that, that's why this would be Amendment 4 if it is approved. And I'll, I'll go over the site plan changes here in a second. Just on what we're voting on today. So Amendment four is what? Just simply the site, the general site development plan. That exhibit, that's the only thing. <clears throat> so uh, a handful of years ago, this property was uh, rezoned PD. And so that required it to go to the planning commission when Golden Antlers requested the, the site plan changes. It did go to the planning commission. They approved it, uh, including what you see here a modification of the new restaurant, uh, a water tank added for fire suppression, and additional parking. A condition was that the restroom that was located near the cantina on the first site plan was removed and moved to the center of the property by the lift station. Also, Golden Antlers was required to submit a, a final uh, general site plan to the planning department for their administrative review, which has been done. And they reiterated the importance of keeping that southern finger down here as a natural area. No development, no storage, leave it natural. So it did go through the planning commission process. I'll show the maps here in a second, but just going over the, the adjustments right quick. One of the row of RV spaces was shifted away from the water's edge, moved more into the center of the property. I mentioned the restroom location shifting. The splash pad that was down further south has been shifted closer to the north northern part of the tip uh, to create kind of like a recreational area. The parking has shifted a little bit. The small pavilion location shifted slightly. The water tank was added for fire suppression and the dining area, the restaurant area, was modified. Now, the reason why this is coming uh, to City Council uh, for consideration is because our lease does state this. Any deviations from the site plan requires uh, Council's written approval, so which means, for me, that means a, a lease amendment. I think these request changes are very positive for the development of this property and add value to our property, the city's property. That's correct. Here's the current site plan. And here is um, the proposed one. So as you see, the one RV row has been moved back to here. This one still stays the same. The restroom that was up here is now down here. The splash pad that was down here is up here. The parking up here has been shifted around a little bit. It's just, it looks different, but it's still in the same general area. The 
The pavilion that was here is now here. This water tank was added. And this dining area looks a little different. And I'll back up just to show it again. The structures are now round as opposed to rectangular. So those were. Well, it fits the landscape better. I'm sorry? It seems to fit into the landscape better. It looks more interesting. <laughs> and that's good. So again, what we're seeking is approval of the site plan adjustments amending the lease amendment, which is exhibit A3. Again, this is just a general site development plan. If there are future adjustments, and there may be, it'll have to go back through the planning commission and back to city council. And if you want, we could put it on the consent agenda next time. If you want to discuss it, then you can pull it. Let's I think it should go back to consent if there's a further development on it. But at this point, I would like a motion to approve item B. I, I move to approve. Uh, Third. With yep. that, any public comment? <laughs> okay. Too slow. <laughs> no public comment. We'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes 7-0. We will now move into item C, consider awarding FS-03-22 dump trucks to multiple vendors in the amount of 988997 for the purchase of five units with the option to purchase two additional units utilizing water reclamation operating budget and fund balance from stormwater and general funds and authorizing the city manager manager to negotiate and execute all related documents. Ryan, you're on. Good morning. I'll be very brief, if I may, and would be happy to elaborate if needed. Um, this item is requesting approval for the bid as, as proposed uh, for the purchase of uh, five trucks with the option to purchase two more um, for multiple vendors, which include uh, Lone Star Truck Group and Roberts Truck Center here in town. Uh, this is the breakdown if I may, of the trucks uh, proposed, two trucks out of general fund for Street and Bridge, one truck from the Water Reclamation Fund for uh, Water Reclamation, and then two trucks, once again, out of the Stormwater Fund. How does the Stormwater pay for dump trucks? Uh, through their general um, equipment replacement budget. Well, I know in, that, but I mean, why would the Stormwater Fund pay for a dump truck? Uh, they use those trucks uh, for multiple operations, material movement, debris management, um, some uh, it, the, the storm-related debris. We often use that department for things like that. So they use. Uh, they don't have a considerable number of trucks. Uh, we have three trucks in that department right now that are beginning to age. Three total. Three total trucks in the stormwater division. Your truck dump truck. Uh, the three total dump trucks in that division, uh, this is proposing to replace two of those trucks. Questions for Ryan? Uh, Ryan, yes, all these local. You buy all the trucks local that you can? Yes, sir, when we can, absolutely. Okay, are these local? These are local, yes, sir, both from uh, Lone Star Truck Group, Robert. which is the Freightliner dealer, and Roberts Truck Center, which is the international dealer. So you're going to dispose of the ones they're replacing? Uh, th most of these trucks are uh, replacements. There are a few of them, and I can elaborate on uh, additions that are, we're adding to our fleet. So where I'm going is when these go back out of our use, they go back out. You auction them off, and you bring that money back in to go to what budget? Does the one that Correct. you get rid of from stormwater go back to the stormwater budget? Yes, sir. All surplus funds go back to the fund in which the unit was purchased. I'm good. With that... Move approval Thank as you. presented. A second. Second. Second by Karen. Any public comment? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to the last item on the agenda, which is item F. Consider the fine as it relates to the City Council's roles through May 2023. One, selecting a mayor pro tem. To appointing the city council members to boards and committees. Um, presentation made by city clerk Julia Antilly. Antilly. So uh, the first item is just um, required by the charter. Anytime a new council member is sworn in, the council is um, directed to appoint a mayor pro tem at their next meeting. So I ask that Tom Thompson continue to be mayor pro tem. Second. You need to second that. <laughs> second it. Uh, any public comment on that? Oh, here they come. Here Tom. they come. <laughs> 
I get a vote now? <laughs> I have served that position with honor for the three minutes I've had to do it. I'll be more than happy to take it again. I don't know how much honor. How much honor with, <laughs> with all of that, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes 7-0. <laughs> The next item. Okay, the next item, um, there are many boards and commissions that the um, city council members are asked to serve on and um, with the vacancy caused by Council Member Carter's um, resignation, we do have an opening on the Con Concho Valley Council of Governments Executive Committee, their General Assembly, the Investment Oversight Committee, and then um, Ports to Plains Advisory Board. While not an official role, we have in the past had um, backups, and so we do have the ability to put somebody in that role if we'd like. Um, they are a non-voting member, so if they attend any of the Ports to Plains meetings, they could represent the city's interest, but they could not vote. First thing I would ask is, uh, Lane Carter was on the executive committee, but he had been on city council for some time. So the question mark is with Karen, um, if someone, if Lucy, you'd rather move up to the executive committee on the council, council valley um, government. Oh. Yeah, that'd be fine. So you, I, I would suggest that Lucy move up to the executive committee and Karen take Lucy's position as general assembly. Okay, and um, Council Member Gonzalez is currently serving on the general assembly, so there would be a second vacancy as well. Yeah, she just well, I just said Karen's Karen would fill her position. Yes, and then we'll need one more person to serve oh, I on see the general. general and so, Larry, do you want to do that? Certainly. Okay. All right. So and then the investment ahead. oversight committee. The investment oversight committee. You want to describe what that is? Um, Tina might be a better fit for that. <laughs> And then we'll ask Karen if she feels comfortable doing it, being her first year on the council. And if she doesn't, we'll discuss a secondary, another person instead. But I think she needs to understand what that means in terms of the role. Thank you, Mayor. Tina Dierski, Director of Finance. The Investment Oversight Committee oversees all of the city's investments as well as the Development Corporation's investments. Um, we are governed by the Public Funds Inve In Investment Act of the state of Texas. Um, and we meet quarterly, uh, usually during the lunch hour, um, to go over our quarterly investment report with our investment advisor as well as our external auditors um, and two external um, financial advisors. Karen, does that, is that something that you feel comfortable doing being your first year on council? I noticed that no one is waving their hands around madly. Well, I'm, no, I'm, because so we're giving you the first right of refusal. Let, <laughs> let, let, me, let me speak up. I have done that in my previous service on the council. If Karen doesn't want to, I am glad to do that since I have a feel for what they do. And I think that makes sense, someone who's been on council longer being in that position because it is important. Okay. So, so I'm glad to do it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, and the last one is Ports to Plain Advisory Board. Um, again, it's non-voting. I'm the treasurer of Ports to Plains, and at this point I haven't missed anything, but um, I think it would be fine to continue with that position, and I think it would be good to have Karen involved in that. Thank you. If there's agreement from everyone. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so what else do you need? Okay, so if we could just get, um, I have, um, moving um, council member Gonzalez to the executive committee and um, adding both council members Karen Hesse Smith and um, Larry Miller to the general assembly then um, council member Hebert for the investment oversight committee and then council member Hesse Smith for ports to plains in the non-voting role could I get a motion for that I'll make that motion a second by Larry any public comment with none we'll take a vote all in favor say aye Aye. 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 Motion passes 7-0. We will now, that uh, completes our regular agenda. Um, there is no closed session today. There are no follow-up and administrative issues. So at this point, we will ask for a motion for adjournment. May I, I have one? Who made the motion? I did. Uh, Tommy did and seconded by Larry. Any objections from council members? With none, we are formally adjourned with a 7-0 vote.